um, regardless of which team you might support. My name is Kayla Murray and I'm the Standing Committee Chair for Finance and today in particular Economic Opportunities and Tourism. Um, I do hope you feel welcomed. If you're nervous, please don't be. Um, we're really just here in the spirit of cooperation and accountability. Um, with that, I would like to offer the members on the Standing Committee an opportunity to introduce themselves, those in line and those whom um, those in the house and those who might be online. From there, I'll hand over to the Minister and HOD. If um, Minister and HOD, for the sake of time, if you wouldn't mind just um, introducing the entirety of your team. All right, with that, I'll hand over to the members. Good morning, everybody. Andrikis van der Weesthuizen. Good morning, everybody. I'm Lula Mamvimbi. Good morning, Chair. Good morning to the Minister and the Department. Uh, my name is Mbulelo Isaac Sileko, member of the committee. Thank you very much, Chair. Good morning and good morning to everybody. My name is Radik Barangesh, member of this committee. Thank you very much, members. I just want to check, are there any members online who would like to introduce themselves? I see none. With that, I'll hand over to the Minister and HOD to introduce themselves and just briefly their teams. Uh, good morning, Honourable Chair and to the members of the committee. Uh, thank you very much uh, for hosting us this morning. We're here to present the annual reports uh, of the Department of Economic Development and Tourism, uh, led by Mr. Vili Ledube. Uh, we also have the senior management team from the department here. Uh, we're also very happy to have our entities present. Uh, we have uh, Westgro, uh, led by uh, CEO Ms. Renal Stunder. Uh, then we have uh, the uh, Freeport Saldana. And we have the CEO, Ms. Kashifa Birkus, here. And then we have Atlantis Special Economic Zone. And we have the CEO, um, um, Matt um, <laughs> Cannonan, right? Yeah, yeah, Cannonan. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, yes, I think we also have uh, several board members present as well, so we'd like to welcome them. Um, HOD, I don't know if you want to introduce some of the management team here. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Chair and members, and thank you very much, Minister. Just to confirm that we have all the officials from the Department of Economic Development, all the program leads are here, and also we have the executives uh, supporting these three CEOs from the three entities, and to save time, Minister, I think that we that would suffice. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. And a warm welcome again to everybody. To note, we have no apologies received for today. Um, and I'd just like to briefly touch on our rules of engagement um, before we kick off. So to those who are online, um, a note to please keep yourselves muted and to keep your video off for the duration of today's meeting unless called upon to speak. Any points of order you can raise in the chat function. And when we do call for questions, um, you can use the raise hand function to do so. With that, I am going to swiftly move on um, to the consideration of the 2022-23 annual report for the department. Um, members, just for your own noting, I'm going to be tabling thereafter A, B and D um, in total so that we can move a bit quicker today, given how much we have to get through. With that, I'll hand over to the Minister. Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I'll keep my uh, remarks uh, brief, given the amount of content we have to get through today. Uh, in the year under review, that being the 2022-23 financial year, uh, one of the most significant milestones of the department and relating to the entities was the completion of the Growth for Jobs strategy. Um, which was achieved and definitely worth celebrating. And uh, just as a reminder, the strategy aims to um, dramatically lift the provincial growth rate, economic growth rate, uh, and achieve breakout economic growth. Um, it was also a year where we uh, thankfully saw recovery in the tourism and event sector. It was also a year of unprecedented load shedding. It was also a year where there was a, a crippling strike at the port of Cape Town. Um, it was also the year that we were just coming out of the pandemic and the COVID lockdowns. It seems so far away now, but uh, certainly in this period, you'll still see the remnants of it reflected. Uh, also, just to note um, that I started in the executive a few months into the financial year. So there are some projects that are before my time, but we have uh, um, excellent officials here that will be able to answer any of the committee's questions. Thank you. HUD, would you like to make any remarks? Thank you very much, Chair. Maybe if I could just maybe build on Minister's uh, opening comment. 
that the department was seized with completing the G4J strategy, which is an all of government strategy. And the strategy distinguishes itself in that it takes a long term view of growth to 2035. And as indicated, we're looking for a four to six percent growth that takes the economy of the Western Cape to a trillion rand economy by 2035. The reason that is important is because we need a much higher and faster growth uh, so that it is the kind of growth that takes our people out of poverty, that it creates the necessary jobs um, and also that it can also uh, lift the rest of the South African economy as a part of its contribution to the greater economy of, the, uh, of South Africa. The department had to reposition itself to make sure that it can deliver on the strategy. And in the year under review, we commenced with the way of redefining our role in the execution of the strategy, supported by the work that we've already started that looks at organizational design to make sure that we have a fit for purpose and future fit organization as the department. That work is currently underway and we hope to finish that work by the end of the current financial year and start the new year with a wholly redefined uh, ex ex organization. We had a very um, successful year insofar as the financials are concerned, maybe just to highlight that the department had an appropriation of 510 million and 30, uh, 510 and 030 million, and the department has been able to spend 98.6% of that uh, appropriation, which is a a, 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 a mean feat. We also would like to mention, Chair, that we had no um, uh, unauthorized fruitless and wasteful expenditure as a department. We also know, Chair, that last year one of our entities had uh, received a qualified audit. I'm pleased to uh, confirm, Chair, that uh, the work that the entity has done, which is WEGRO, together with the board, and also the support from the department has really seen some great improvement in that, in that, in that regard. We still have challenges going ahead. The economy is not growing as fast as it was to be globally and also in South Africa. And I think this is really to emphasize that the strategy as we have it becomes absolutely critical that we execute fully um, so that we can take the growth of the economy to, to, the, to the new level. There will be some highlights in the presentations as we go, but I'd like to stop at that point. Fantastic, thank you. Um, short and sweet. Members, we will now open up for questions. Again, tabling A, B and D. If you can please raise your hand to indicate if you have any. I recognize Member Seleko. Yes. Good morning, Chair. Chair, I'm not going to be long as my hide today. Uh, but just uh, firstly, I would like to congratulate the department in terms of their audit outcomes. And especially noting that there's no uh, wasteful and fruitless expenditure. That is something that we tend to appreciate and say, keep on doing what you are doing in terms of that. And just a little bit in terms of page 12, I would just like to, if your department can just expand in terms of the SMME, the Booster Fund 2022, uh, which kind of... Uh, Give me more, if just more in terms of that, what you guys, what has been the, the successes have, what has been the challenges regarding that particular fund. And secondly, uh, noting, uh, Minister, what I've said yesterday, that we, have, we are faced with times of uncertainty in terms of our fiscal uh, strength in the country. And noting the kind of work that you, uh, your department does in terms of tourism, and also looking in terms of page 28 and 29, you see a lot of faces, faceless people. And, you know, and one would want to know, you know, whether those faceless people are going to get faces in the near future. Uh, also taking into consideration, you know, that we have to cut and cut and cut and cut. You know, the reason I'm, I'm asking this question, I don't want when members return next year that they find the same faceless people that they pose the same question to the department. You know, so I just want us to, to clear that one that if we're going to be faceless for the next few years, then at least we need to accept that. Then if there is any uh, potential that we'll be able to fill some of the positions, then that should, should be something that we should share with us so that we understand. Those are the first two, Chair. Thank you very much. Very much. I recognize Member Van der Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, on page 12, 
you sp- and on, on various other pages, you, sp- you speak about trade agreements that you've signed. Now, in my mind, the moment I think trade agreement, I think it's an agreement between two countries, uh, you know, having got tax implications and things like that. So perhaps if you could just uh, e- expand slightly on the on the 3.1 billion in trade agreements, what do you mean by that? And uh, I do know that some companies may not want to be named in public, but if it's possible to just give us an indication of that, I would I would appreciate that. Also, uh, on another page, you 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 highlight a few of the countries which have really invested, or from countries from where entrepreneurs have invested in the Western Cape, and and an interesting name there was the name of Norway. And I was wondering if that relates to one specific investment by one company. Because traditionally, you know, Norway wasn't one of our biggest, can I call it, uh, partners when it comes to, uh, uh, you know, investments and and so on. Then I'm really, uh, page 12 is the an estimated 3.1 billion of trade agreements. Uh, I did mark the one where, where the three countries were listed that have uh, invested but but it's particularly the the name of Norway that uh, that struck me. It's on page 38 in the middle of the page. Norway, Germany, and the United States being the leading foreign investors in the Western Cape for the period under under review. Good. So then the the second one on page 12. I'm always interested in skills development and innovation. Uh, now uh, also. On another page, you refer that your model for skills development has changed, whereas in the past we supported training and then left it to the to the uh, students or the young people to go and find employment themselves. And now it seems to me your model has changed, whereby you rather first want them to find a, an employer and then assist them with with uh, training. Uh, please, if you could just help me. Uh, understand, you know, the reasons, and and then you also say, but this new model seems to be more effective, but it's a it's a very expensive model. Uh, quoting from your from your uh, annual report, and then uh, she just paging on. Can I then just uh, on page thirty five? That is section B. You say you, you find if we if we cover more than than one section here, um, the business confidence index again in the middle of page thirty five, where it says the Western Cape economy outlook. You say, however, year on year, provincial business confidence uh, index has experienced a decline of thirteen index points. At thirty nine, the Western Cape business Confidence index is still below the neutral point of 50, discouraging for the provincial recovery trajectory and investment projects. Perhaps if you wouldn't mind us just sharing with us, is there anything that we can do to turn that uh, worsening of confidence uh, around? Because my impression was that you know a lot of people do have confidence in the Western Cape, and as a matter of fact, that the index for the Western Cape should be above that of, of many of the uh, other uh, provinces. Uh, those are my first three questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'm sorry. Thank you, Member. Members, are there any further questions? I recognize, okay, apologies. I see that there is a legacy hand or an older hand from uh, Member and Kontlo. So I'll take Member and Kontlo and then I'll jump to you, Member. Thank you. Member and Kontlo. Morning, Chair, and morning, colleagues. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. Uh, Chair, I just want, I think my first questions would be on the input uh, of the of the HOD, uh, which I think also is covered uh, in both uh, his uh, remarks and that of the minister in the annual report, particularly in the G4J uh, strategy as a response to grow the economy, the Western Cape economy, to 6%. Um, I must say, uh, at once, uh, I would want to appreciate, I think, the strategy and its um, a, a broader intent. 
of trying to grow the economy in a in a way that uh, actually bolsters uh, uh, jobs. Uh, the uh, which I think some, um, uh, both the minister and the HOD would have um, uh, understood my views on the matter, and I would raise them again here. One is that one of the things that HOD you raise is, is one of the critical feature, features of any economic growth, which is about the participation of the um, economically active people in the economy. And therefore, whilst acknowledging one, Cape is, uh, has got the lowest unemployment uh, in aggregate terms. The truth of the matter, if we go and look, and I'm sure the mayor will then shed even more light, that is the latest that will be um, 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 uh, presented in the next month, about the pockets of poverty, uh, the pockets of um, uh, inequality in our province. And these pockets of and inequality mirror a state that we have known for years, which are part of what is in our history. And my question now is, what then, because this is one thing I've, I've found is lacking in the G4J strategy, because the G4J does exactly the same mistake that is done by developing economies in general, South Africa, including here in the Western Cape. The issue of not wanting to be targeted in the approach specifically of particular geographies that um, uh, bring about or uh, fester um, uh, uh, poverty. Those geographies, if you consider here in the, in, the, in the city of Cape Town, will be your Cape Flats. If you go into the non-metro, will be townships, you know, where the enclaves of poverty are very glaring. And that, uh, that uh, data and evidence, I think, and the top about it. And my issue here is that what, what then would be a response of the G4J in, in dealing with this structured inequality, structured unemployment that has to do with where people are located, where people are residing, where people are born um, at, which are circumstances that um, are not touched if we look at our special and other issues. This actually also linked to what um, a member Andrikas raises about the issue of skills. And we know currently we're sitting with a challenge of a math and science um, a regression in terms of performance of the, of, the, of the province. And also we know that in the same geographies that one is talking about, you will find that the issue of mathematics and science or STEM subjects has been something that is not gaining a, a positive to enable these um, uh, citizens that would be born in those particular areas because the challenge one that is having is that the approach that uh, actually says survival of the fittest or a big brother that says, you know, if you are born in circumstances that enables you, you would always be the one who is, who is absorbed by this economy is an issue that goes against this um, noble intent an economic growth that grows at a higher percentage and, and is able to pick up uh, uh, others that are on the sidelines. And my last uh, 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 issue, uh, Chair, as I said, that I'm only going to ask in that particular, in the G4J uh, uh, strategy, my last issue, again, is the extent to which do we have any data in the province that tells us about our performance in as far as SMMEs of SMMEs, that is new businesses, but also those that are in the small and medium and propelling them. And can we be able to get that data annually that tells us how are we performing? I know that there is even an index. I think it's an international index. And I know West, um, South Africa has been faring very badly in terms of creating um, uh, SMMEs, you know, in the country. Do we have that data as it relates to the Western Cape? If so, about SMME development. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much, Member Nkontlo. Just to flag, you were breaking up um, in bits and pieces. Um, I think if the department can indicate when answering the questions if there was anything they weren't unsure of, 
um, just to clarify with you, or that they might have missed. Okay, they indicated that they have the gist of your questions. In this, are there any further questions? Yes, Member Mvambi, thank you. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Regarding page 12, I will hear on the answers that are going to be given. On the, as I think, Honorable Selego has already asked that question. So I will just hear in, in, on the questions that are going to be given. Then on page 28, on the organizational structure, there is the, the, the shades, the dark shades the, of a 10 vacant position. It's uh, as much as it's dark shades, I hope it does not indicate a dark cloud because it can, if we can just be given as to the reason why has those positions, it's actually 10 of them that has not been filled. If it's dark shades, that it's 10 unfilled vacancies. Any reasons are they not important post or are you not able to attract uh, suitable people or to fill in those positions? And my next question will be on, because uh, you said we must deal with A, P, and T, Chair. I will then move to page 83. I will deal with A. A, B, and D, yeah. And D, A, P, and D. So on B, if I move to page 83. Well, page 83. Yeah. Okay. The summary of sub program 5.4 and 5.5 achievements. One, two, three, four. That is 83. Um, and 83 is part B. It, it, it's B. Yeah. Yeah. So one, two, three, four. I think bullet four and five in relation to land investor anchor properties in the zone two investor discussion underway to issue principal agreement for 17 hectares of land in total. There's also an expression of interest there. If maybe we can just be given more details. I think in terms of the notarial deeds, we only allow to make a lease of up to 10 years, 9.9 .9 years. How, does, how do we end up having 50 year lease? Uh, you know, if maybe we can just have a, a more explanation on that. Thanks, Jefferson. Thank you, member. Members, any further questions? I see none. I'd just like to use this as an opportunity um, to firstly ask a question with regards to Minister's opening remarks. Um, I think we're, we're all very excited for Brentford Jobs to kick off and to see it coming into fruition. Um, looking at the annual reports, I see there's approximately 3,000 jobs generated from DDAT and from the entities, um, which is very welcomed. And um, I'm curious to know when we'll start to see these numbers increase as a result of G4J. Um, is this something we can anticipate in the next annual report, for example, or am I being overly ambitious? Um, I also just wanted to commend you on the audit finding for Westgro. Um, I think particularly under the leadership of Minister and CEO, um, a massive congratulations to turn that around in one year. Um, I take my hats off to you. And then lastly, just on page 12, um, I'm interested in the business helpline service. So I, I see that there is quite a significant satisfaction rate of 80%, um, which is great, but how can we improve that? So my question is um, relatedly, um, when with that 20%, why do people tend not to be satisfied? What are the nature of their complaints? And then also um, noting the number is about 500 calls. Is there a way that we could bolster that service? Is there capacity? And if there isn't capacity, is it maybe possible to consider partnering with private? So I think there's my way insurer that uh, provides business assistance as well. So maybe looking at private as a, as a way to expand that service. It sounds like an invaluable one. With that, I'll hand over to the department and to the minister. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, the majority of questions are for DDAT, but uh, there was a question for Westgro and uh, Freeport Saldan as well. So we'll um, phone a friend. <laughs> uh, so the first question uh, from uh, Honourable Sileko was on the SMME Booster Fund. Uh, so uh, if 
I could maybe ask um, sure. Joshua uh, just to go through the booster fund, how it works, uh, what are some of the successes, uh, some of the, the challenges experienced, but also then what we're moving towards uh, in uh, in the future with the, with this fund. Thanks. John. Okay, thank John. you very much, Honourable Member, for that question. Um, just with the booster fund, um, maybe just some background to it. Uh, it it's a fund that, that we've developed uh, since 2019. And it's very much a fund based on what is what is demanded by the market. So what we do is, instead of going on our own, we go to the market and we ask them for proposals on what they're doing. Now, typically, it would be your service providers, it could be foundations, it could be uh, chambers of commerce, it could even be um, even departments. So what they would do is they would submit proposals to us. We would then consider and assess those proposals in terms of you know, how quickly the project can start, the funding is leveraged, the number of businesses are started. So we have certain categories. We Once we approve that, we then partner fund with them. So say, for example, I'll give you an actual example. Now, say Lulu, that comes from the, that's by very much based in the township. They'll give us a proposal. We will look at it and they will say, look, the project is worth 2 million rand. They're looking for 500,000 or a million rand. We then partner with them on that project. It's called the booster fund because what we then do is we see how that project can either be expanded, in other words, putting putting more SMMEs on it, or deepen in in that giving you actually give the SMMEs more services. So if the original proposal was one to three services, our money could be the fifth service or the fourth service, or they could say, you know what, if you're going to give us X amount of money, we will increase increase the numbers. So it's like I said, it's very much a partnership based uh, a, a fund, and uh, in that way, we're also leveraging funding in in most cases from the from the private sector. Thank you. Uh. Thank you very much. Uh, then uh, we had a couple of questions about the organogram and the vacancy. So I'll take both uh, from Honourable Sileko and uh, Honourable Mvimbi. So un unfortunately, the organogram may, may be a little bit misleading in that it shows unfunded posts as well, uh, where the true reflection um, of funded posts and vacancies against funded posts can be found on page 143, um, where the picture's uh, significantly different there and probably the more accurate reflection then of what our organogram and vacancy against funded posts should look like. Um, that being said, uh, the organogram is outdated and we'll need to respond to the growth for jobs strategy. So the HOD and the team have been working hard on an organizational development uh, redesign of it. And uh, HOD, maybe you just expand a little bit on that. Yes, th thank you very much. So in response to G4J, then the order of business for the department had to change. Um, so the types of activities, the types of function would have to change to respond to G4J. Big part of it being about business uh, development and business support, being part of it being about growing investments and exports as part of the main activity, and then also being preparing to make sure that we have the right skills for what the economy requires, that's the workforce development, but also more important, the organogram is looking at clustering like for like, so that we can benefit from the benefit of skills residing in a specific area to make sure that you get economies of scale and also to look at cost optimization. So that's really the direction we are going. We are now at the point where we are developing the draft straw dock, and by the end of the financial year, we should have the process with the necessary approvals uh, signed off uh, to start with the new financial year with a completely new uh, redesigned organization. Okay, yeah, so, so maybe the minister is uh, raising a quite an important point. So with the approval of the straw dock at the end of the new financial year, then there's further work that needs to happen. So the new organogram will not reflect in the new financial year but the year, the year after. So I just want to make sure that the committee is is aware of that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. So, um, Honourable Sileko, the it will remain in next in the next year's financial uh, next financial year's annual report. Yeah. But the work will have already been completed by that time. <laughs> okay. Then uh, the next question from Honourable Van der was regarding trade agreements and specifically the importance of Norway. Uh, if I could maybe ask Voice to respond to that one. It's on page 38 of our of DDAT's annual report. Okay, thank you, Minister. Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, everyone. 
Um, the investment, I'll answer the investment question first and then the trade question. With respect to investments, um, you're correct, it was 4.13 billion and one of it was from Norway. If you look at page 31 of the WESCRA annual report, you will see all of them listed there. Um, so that's a total of 40 new projects that were facilitated um, across multiple sectors um, with about 50% coming um, from foreign investors, Norway, Germany, and the United States. I'll talk to the one from Norway, um, and that particular investment um, is from a, is for a company called Proteus, um, and it's an insect-based alternative. Um, uh, alternative. I just want to get uh, some of the additional information the team has sent. Um, it is an aquaculture investment feed for aqua farming. Um, it's a partnership with a BE company um, called Pioneer Fishing. Uh, the company is fully transformed with black-owned shareholders, African Pioneer Marine, 90% owned, and the remaining 10% owned by the Employee Share um, Ownership Trust. Um, so, so that is really the, the Norwegian um, question. With respect to trade, um, the amount was 3.13 billion um, uh, in new trade agreements. If you look at if you look at pages 36 to 39 of the Westgro annual report, um, you will see that all of the agreements um, are listed there. We signed about 83 trade agreements. Um, and the markets were from the USA, UAE, Cameroon, France, and Namibia. Um, the sectors were food and beverages, manufacturing services, primary agriculture, and clothing and textiles. So that just gives a bit more color to um, the, the, the the line in in the, in the annual report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Minister. Uh. Thanks, Chair. The next question was then on skills development and specifically the model that uh, DDAT employs for uh, for the um, uh, on-the-job training, um, which I could ask Ms. Arm to, to speak to, but also um, in terms of the costs associated with the program, how we leverage funding, and maybe uh, you could just mention the expenditure review that was conducted by GTAC, which talks about value for money and the outcomes from this program. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, yes, Member, you're absolutely correct. Our approach used to be, let's look for occupations in high demand and provide the necessary skilling and accreditation, and then have those individuals then find work. Um, and it makes a lot of sense, right? We're training for occupations in high demand. Uh, we found, um, and I just want to mention that uh, the skills program is the most externally <clears throat> programs. Uh, we then realized that it's fairly complex. Um, and the reason that individuals are not being employed, even if they have a qualification, may include there's a lack of on-the-job experience, there's a behavioral deficit in the individual, there's a very restrictive labor um, regulations, there's asymmetry of information between what the learner can do and its behavior and what the company thinks and the company is resistant. Um, so what we then did was we developed these experiential learning that programs which provides a qualification, the accreditation, the on-the-job training, deals with a behavioral component, deals with on-the-job skilling. You are absolutely correct, it's very expensive, but we it resulted in more than 80% absorption after the program. Um, in recognition that the tight fiscal space we were in, uh, we knew that we have to do this with partners. So we engage with other partners, the CETAs, national government, and private sector. So last year, our budget of 85 million, we leveraged more than 200 million in external funding. Um, we had a review done by GTAC, National Treasury, with Provincial Treasury. And this is one of the cheapest programs in the country that results in a job. 15,333 ran in a job versus over 60,000 in EPWP. The absorption on EDP is shockingly low. Our absorption is more than 80%. And this is true for every occupation, whether it's in high demand or non-high demand um, occupations. Um, yeah, I think, is that it, Minister? Thanks. 
Joe, Joe will take. Um, if I could ask, uh, Joe, would you mind taking the business confidence index question and what goes into it and why it looks the way it does? <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, so the business confidence index uh, is basically uh, an indication of obviously our business one uh, currently feels about the economy, but also about the prospects going forward. Um, and so it's essentially a measurement usually done on across a, a number a set number of companies and it's done uh, on a fairly regular basis. I think it's just a measurement of business and how they're feeling about the economy. And it's an important index because essentially it starts shaping where the businesses are considering expanding uh, um, or, or employing more people. Um, if, if essentially businesses are not feeling terribly confident, then clearly there's either a contraction that we need to anticipate or a growth in unemployment. So it's essentially a measure of sentiment uh, by our private sector. I think in South Africa, uh, particularly post-COVID, there was an expectation that there would be a bounce up, uh, given the fact that we emerged from the lockdowns. Uh, I think what probably did uh, South Africa quite substantially was the load shedding. Uh, and given the knock-on effect that it had on the fact that companies couldn't operate, they couldn't necessarily trade appropriately. And so when we look at business confidence and how, uh, and we'll remember how we increase it, it's really about how we create an enabling economy. And I think over the last uh, period, the Western Cape has always kind of slightly outperformed uh, the rest of the economy, uh, the rest of the country. Um, and the last uh, measurement indicates that we went up four uh, points to 35, um, although 50 is considered to be a positive and anything below 50 is considered to be negative. And I think because businesses are mindful of the load shedding and the threat of the load shedding. And so that is why the province has concentrated so heavily and prioritized, if you like, the energy component of our growth for job strategy, because we understand that if we want to grow the economy, we do need to deal with the binding constraints and the fundamentals of what creates or what is an enabled economy. And so one of the key aspects is energy, which is where you're starting to see slightly positive sentiment because some of the initiatives that the province is, is undertaking is essentially starting to uh, have yeah, very confidence. Thanks. If I could then take the uh, next question that uh, relates to um, township uh, or not being targeted in our approach uh, raised by member um, Nkondlo. Part of one of the key principles of G4J strategy is that we advocate for employability and entrepreneurship. And our role as the government is to create an environment and a space for everyone to thrive who is kin and wants to succeed. But while we recognize that, we also understand that it is our role to provide the necessary information and the necessary skills for people to thrive and for businesses to, to, to thrive. So that's really the general principle of, the, of, of G4J. Grow the economy. Everyone has an opportunity to be employed and everyone has opportunity to thrive as an entrepreneur. That's really why we want the level of growth that we're looking for in the in the G4J, because we're creating an ocean where every fish can succeed. And that's really the, the key principle of, uh, of G4J. Then maybe on more specific questions around what we're doing in spaces and also in data, I'll ask uh, maybe John to, to, to go and then I'll ask it, um, Joanne to, to cover the, the greater principles. Okay, thank you, HOD. Um, just on, on the data question, and this has been it's actually a very good question in that it's not only in the Western Cape, but across South Africa, data for SMME has always been wanting. So what, what we've done for, for, for the coming years, actually, strangely, we had a meeting yesterday, we've got a, an MOU with the DSPD, and part of it of that MOU is to look at how do we actually capture data so that we can look at our successes, and also, especially if we're working in the SMME field, to what extent are we successful and, and are we increasing SMMEs? If we're going to say that SMMEs are sort of the foundation of the economy, are we increasing that numbers? So so there's that one part of the of, of that uh, uh, MOU with the DSBD. Then yesterday we had a meeting with the DFIs, and that is the NEF, it's IDC, it's, it's uh, uh, CIFA, 
and then also with cedar and what we're going to do is uh, cuz actually he doesn't know it we're going to appeal to the to the to the dgs of those of those departments to actually make stats available on the funding that is coming to western cape based smmes through incentives and also through loan funding in that way we can we can so we can actually check in terms of the total pie how much money is coming to the western cape but more importantly what are the pinch points in us not increasing that number so if only 10 are of of uh, SMMEs are succeeding in NEF what about the other 90 that didn't succeed so we can actually do a lot do a lot with, with regard to diagnostics so so that's how we want to take care of the statistics besides i our own statistics in the project that we actually do where we keep meticulous record of of how many jobs have been created has the business grown has it expanded in terms of income in terms of turnover in terms of competitiveness the other big thing that we want to be doing and we we're going to see how, how we can fast track this one is to like in 2014 where were we where we were part of the gem report now what the gem report is the global entrepreneurship monitor it looks across the 152 countries and it measures entrepreneurship rates so in 2014 and and even prior to that 20, 20, 2001 when it started and up until recently the the rates were very much determined on a national level so you don't get it almost granular we're going to be entering into an agreement with the gem to actually disaggregate the entrepreneurship rate so that we can see what the entrepreneurship rate is for the Western Cape. Now, the entrepreneurship rate that is measured by GEM has got two parts. It's got early stage, people who want to start a business, people who just started the business, and the other component that it has is existing rates. So you are able then to see how many new businesses are being started, and also you are able you are able to, to see how much of the existing business are, are sort of falling off or increasing. So just in a nutshell, in terms of the statistics, three parts that we're doing, working with our DFIs through our SMME forum to get that information in terms of loan funding and incentives with DTI. Second one is the is trying to obviously exploiting the, the MOU that you have with the DSBD, that's the Department on Small Business Development. And the third one is partnering with Jim, so that we can get it disaggregated for the for the Western Cape. What I, when the, my in, initial discussion with them is that they geotag the the postal codes, which means that when you're going to be doing some sort of analysis, you can actually get it down to the specific areas in the province. Thank you. Sorry, am I the township? Okay, so if I could just. Oh yes, the spatial issues. So, so the the, the growth for jobs has a very specific uh, spatial lens, um, and in fact, it, the the spatial filter actually crosses all of the the um, the priority focus areas. Um, so, I wanted to say that, and we understand. So, if we look at the strategic framework, it has essentially four pillars. So, one is really how we enable the economy. Second is how do we actually catalyze growth opportunities? And the third thing is how do we stimulate market growth and with a particular focus on exports, but also how do we optimize domestic uh, markets? Um, and the filter across those three pillars is essentially the spatial. And with, the idea would be not only that we go broad, but that we also narrow down right down to the level of, of townships and communities. And so when you look at the priority focus areas, almost throughout each one, there is applicability for particularly communities. Um, so I, I wanted to uh, say that with respect to townships, there is explicit interventions that relate to it, again, across a number of those priority focus areas. Um, and I think the one thing that, and, and I'll ask John uh, through the HOD to perhaps expand a little about the uh, strategy that he's developing, but effectively the approach is, is twofold. One, it is structural, uh, which uh, specifically looks at how we deal with systemic challenges of, of, of communities living far away from economic opportunities. And so there are two approaches you could do. You could either take communities to live closer to where the economic activity is. Alternatively, we start strengthening economic activities near to where communities live. Uh, so that's the one issue. And then, of course, the, the mobility that also connects uh, economic opportunity with, uh, with uh, where people live. The second is the action-based plans, and the overall thrust for that is 
how do we coordinate what government does in communities so that we don't end up with sporadic interventions that if we had pooled and collectively uh, um, coordinated across various departments, these individual interventions could have collectively much more impact in those communities. So we shift away from this kind of idea that we had to have one magic intervention that's going to solve everything. So there's a, 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 a an approach around these action plans that coordinates across all the relevant departments, but most importantly also draws in the community uh, uh, the community stakeholders to help guide the government as to what is appropriate and what is desired in those particular communities. Because this is not about, this is our list of interventions which we're going to do. The question is how relevant is it for that community uh, and their specific challenges and opportunities? And then also what has been identified by the community players as to what we need uh, to do in that particular locale. Thank you. Are you gonna are you gonna talk specifically about? Um, yes, yeah, yeah. I, I think just uh, just doing a quick analysis, and I mean, yes, we need to. We obviously looking at the, at the broader strategy, but I think when we looked at our our twenty twenty two figures, fifty five percent of our of our support in terms of the booster fund has already gone to 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 township township based businesses, and if we look at what we're doing for twenty twenty three twenty four. Already 64% will be allocated to township-based businesses or, people, or, or, or entrepreneurs who are based in townships. So a lot of, a lot of work has been done on entrepreneurship front with regard to the township and also to sort of bridge that inequality. I think, but obviously we're looking for a far broader strategy and, and that guidance we got from, from the G4J that specifically speaks about how do you make how do you make these places more vibrant? But I think there's two parts to it. Making it more vibrant, making it an attraction for investment, but more importantly also is how do you get people who are, who are, who are unemployed in the township to access opportunities outside? And that's different ways. There's the decent transport skills and stuff like that. So basically, in terms of what we're proposing, as, and we'll, we'll find uh, the strategy has been finalized, it's that two components. The one component being making it a place of vibrancy in terms of economic growth and economic development, a place which attracts investments, we people want to go and then the other part is the, the young people especially the youth in those areas how are we actually arming them to take opportunities which which in many cases lie outside of the of the of the area so it's a very interesting conversation I had with a with a with a with a, with a researcher yesterday on the township and he says that um, the biggest thing that we we need to consider is is extortion and he was saying that extortion and crime, and there's, there's three targets for this the, the extortion. It's um, it's entrepreneurs, it's young people, and it's women. So he says, John, if you, if you can work on that, that's already something that you that that's that's a huge accomplishment. So I think when we take in on this township, uh, to this 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 township, uh, 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 I'm call it a, not a challenge, but I mean this town this township challenge of of mainstreaming that economy into the into into the in, sorry. Oh, mainstreaming that economy in, into the our economy um we, we need to look at it in terms of into those two components the one that i said make it the vibrant place of opportunity and of investment and the other other part is like working in, in collaboration with with nizam how do you get people skilled to be able to take opportunities to take or, or exploit opportunities outside of the area and even in the area thanks and of course, uh, you know, the G4J has several principles on which it is built and redress and equality of opportunity are, are two of those principles. Uh, then moving on, uh, Honourable Mvimbi asked a question about the Freeport Saldana on page 83, if I could hand over that question. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Minister, and good morning, uh, committee. Um, so the expression of interest that was published to the market to lease development rights for 20 hectares of land for 50 years. I think that that's the um, the question. So it was on it is on land that uh, we own. So therefore we are able to place tenants um, on the land for more than 10 years, more than you know. And um, to date, we've actually signed an, a 99 year lease for uh, one, uh, um, one tenant because of the land that we own, it's notarized, it's a notarized lease. The whole, I want to say, overarching, the expression of interest is part of a capital raising initiative that uh, the Freeport is doing, um, and uh, which we raise in, in our um, an annual report. 
uh, because we want to investigate all avenues to ensure and create the environment that the Freeport is financially self-sustainable going forward. Thank you, Chair. Then finally, your question, Chair. Um, just a reminder that the growth for jobs strategy is premised on the enablement of the private sector because it is the private sector that creates jobs and it is our job as government to make that as easy as possible to do. Um, so the what we're trying to achieve is uh, an economic growth rate in the province of between 4 and 6% by 2035. And our modelling suggests that if we can get that right, we're looking at about 600,000 new jobs in the province. And that's why economic growth is the pathway that we have selected to, um, to create jobs in the province and then hence growth for jobs. Um, so hopefully that addresses your question uh, regarding jobs. I'd like to echo your sentiments on the Westcrow audit. We're incredibly proud of the hard work that's been put in by the entity. And it is really remarkable to go from a qualified to an unqualified audit in one year. So thank you very much uh, for those words of support. Then finally, you asked us some questions on the red tape reduction unit and how um, we can look at improving the customer satisfaction rates and also the accessibility of the call center. If I could ask uh, maybe uh, John sure. Peters to answer that one. Yeah, thank you. Um, the, the the business support helpline is the only such service in the country for for businesses in in the in the if you look at the provinces. So what we've done is we, we initially when we started out we had a target of 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 complaints and it's a bit of a difficult one because you know how do you have a target for complaints? So what we did was we turned it around and said let's have a satisfaction rate. So the numbers that you see there's 519 are, are the calls that would come in or the requires that would come in. And the satisfaction rate that what we measured in the following way, where we would uh, call the client and say, look, uh, you we dealt, you dealt with us. And, and is it the questions like, how was the agent? How was this? Or how was the, the case manager? And then what you typically find is where the 20% drops off is where you basically maybe have ruled in favor of the other person. So, for example, it's a, it's a permit that is, sitting, that is apparently stuck. And then the client would call in and say, listen, I'm waiting for my permit, only to discover that um, the client didn't fill the documents in properly or it's actually the client's fault. And then when you ask him, are you satisfied with the service? No, I'm not satisfied with the service. So it wasn't in, it wasn't resolved in their favor. You know what I mean? So that's the 20% that we got. What we also do is that because we cut the, the marketing budget with regard to that, because we increase in our, our 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 outreach programs now. So, for example, we we sort of attend. Um, I think now all of the banks supply development programs, and there would be a, call it a captive audience of about say 50 to 60. And part of what we do in outreach, not only in terms of the business support, is then also to tell them about the helpline. So, through our various sort of outreach programs, we do that. We also do that when we when we partner with the with the consumer protector because they in many cases help SMMEs. We would then well, sort of then tell them what the service is about, and then also very active on social media. We would say, look, if you got a problem, give the helpline a call or drop us a mail, and then we'll resolve it. Right? We also because it's a sort of a, yeah, call it sort of we, we we're quite well known. We also get quite a few calls now. And then yesterday or two days ago was with regard to a, a, a tourism permit for operating license. We get we get referrals from the presidency in terms of resolving the issues uh, in the Western Cape. Uh, about a month ago, we also got a, a question uh, to resolve something at the Johannesburg Zoo, which we, we try to help them on that one. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, members, I think for the sake of time, if you don't mind, we'll take another round of questions and then move on to the next um, entity. Everybody's quiet. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. It's, it, uh, the, the work of the entities are so interwoven, it is sometimes difficult. And, and while I'm saying that, I'm trying to appraise each of these, the department and the entity's performance but there seems to be a lot of double dipping. Uh, people claiming success for the department and then uh, Westcrow would say, no, 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 it's actually, you know, we <laughs> that facilitated that investment. So it's a, it's a, it's a difficult one to really appraise which, uh, uh, who's, who's responsible for which success. And I must say, I think success has got many, many, many owners. So 
May, may I then just ask in terms of the... Sorry, I just before you, you jump into that, I just wanted to confirm if members were happy that we take one last round and then we'll take questions. Okay, everyone's nodding. All right, Member Fund of STS. Gosh, okay. Um, may I then just go on to construction? Construction, in terms of your figures, has been one of the biggest job creating uh, uh, sectors in the Western Cape. Now, all construction... Once to, to get to the construction phase, there's a long process of approvals, uh, uh, etc. Uh, there needs to be some infrastructure to support that, that etc. Now, uh, in terms of, of, of these approvals, uh, my impression is that, you know, many of our municipalities uh, do have some backlogs in the approval of building plans. Uh, or the approval of, of particular bigger developments, particularly when people start asking for encroachments and deviations and so on. So uh, my question is, to what extent, and I, I do notice that you refer to a number of municipalities by name, but to what extent do you keep track of, uh, can I call it the challenges that business people experience, particularly property developers, at local government level in terms of getting the necessary approvals. Uh, and, and I don't mind if you say no to a developer, but please, it must be quick so that you can come up with a with an alternate plan. But what we find is that quite often when these uh, are difficult ones, that municipalities, can I say, sit on their hands. They, they, they're not that quick to always respond to those with either a yes or a, or a no. So my first question is, to what extent uh, are you monitoring this? To what extent are you supporting our, our municipalities? And I do know there's another department called development planning that, that also liaises with our uh, municipalities. But then uh, also in terms of property development, to what extent does, can we have incentives and now perhaps in, uh, some of the entities may want to 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 respond, such as Atlantis, where where it seems to me as if there's a lot of uh, green fields, a lot of undeveloped land, and yet we are already investing in further infrastructure, but the existing land that is there that is already uh, either privately owned or so is not fully utilised. Some of the factories are standing empty, etc. So. Have we spoken to, for example, our municipalities and said, you know, a tax incentive that works, this is the way it looks. Uh, this is the way in which you can attract more investment to your uh, your sphere of government, to your to your area, et, et cetera. So, so if you could, in terms of construction, perhaps just, just help me there. And I do note, if you want a reference on page 37, you speak there of uh, the unit uh, especially with the red tape reduction intervention, hosted an intervention with the South African Renewus, Revenue Service regarding tax incentives and benefits, and you also apparently work to the Construction Industry Development Board. And then, Chair, and, uh, uh, the next one is the, the whole issue of green hydrogen, which I think has created a lot of hype, a lot of interest, uh, but from what I've read up on green hydrogen, it requires a lot of energy. Now, on the one hand, we sit in South Africa with an energy crisis. We can't even service our existing households, our existing factories. And now we've identified green hydrogen as a potential growth industry, which is a highly energy intensive uh, in, in industry. Uh, how do we bring these two uh, together. It, it just uh, it seems to me as if it might be somewhat problematic. And then a last question linking on to the previous one of skills development. How do you experience the contribution of our FET colleges? And I do know that Atlantis, you know, in their report, they refer to the West Coast College that has got a campus there, etc. But it, it seems to me as if we must get Minister Zemandi into some of these these engagements. Uh, for example, uh, we if we go to into our townships and we look at who's got the cell phone repair shops, these are m more often than not foreigners. Because 
my understanding is our own FET colleges don't offer the four and the six months courses in cell phone repairs. So, you know, whose task is it to speak to Minister Nzimandi? Can we play a role to ensure that our young South Africans are, are equipped with the skills that would allow them to, to earn a living? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, members. Any further questions? I see Member Seleko. Thank you very much, Chair. Chair, I will start with a just with a follow-up in terms of the uh, booster fund. I think what we tend to to miss in every success minister is the faces on all the beautiful stories or help that we are rendering is is the faces. Because I've been looking at your report and I look all all the targets that you are meeting. You're meeting the targets, which is beautiful. But I think what, what we tend to lose and not see is linking the numbers to people, linking the numbers to communities, and linking the numbers to our diverse uh, citizens within the Western Cape. The reason I'm, I'm saying that is because one would always talk about uh, township economy and you know all those kind of things and one would always say that a lot has not been done because we are not talking about these things you know i think my approach here in terms of the question that i will be last, like to ask is the same in, is on page uh 57 you know in in terms of prosa program 2.1 you you had a target of 240 you exceeded with 30 can you just give us more details in terms of who is this businesses that you guys are actually engaging in? Who are you actually assisting? So that we can have an understanding of what, what kind of work you as a department is currently doing. It will also be, I will also link it to page 59 in terms of the department was able to assist four more businesses with existing interventions. What kind of businesses is this? you know, give us more information so that we, at least we have an understanding as, you know, try to put a name to a face or a face to a name so that we can deal with most of the perceptions that we, we find in terms of questions that have been posed to the department. And also in terms of sub-program 2.4, where you exceeded also in terms of dealing with your red, your, or pace of, of in the, a red unit reduction. You know, you, you've exceeded your, your percentage, your target was 85, but you resolved 91 cases. Who is these people that are actually calling you? Where do they come from? What are they saying? You know, just give us more in terms of that. That is on page 61. And then let's go to page 69 in terms of 1.507 jobs facilitated into the province as a result of committed investment by West Group. You know, those are kind of things we are saying. We are talking about numbers of 1,507 people. Where do these people come from? From which areas are these people coming from? Who is actually benefiting from these initiatives? Who is benefiting from this investment? So that we can deal with this narrative and perceptions in terms of the kind of work that you as a department is doing. And lastly, Chair, it will be... I think that's my, my questions. I think just we need to, and also in, there's a lot that has been said in terms of municipalities. And also latching out to what the minister has been saying that the department is to create that environment so that the private sector can actually strive in creating businesses. But now I'm worried in terms of the state of our municipalities in assisting also the department in actually, because all these things are not happening in the province. They're happening down there on the lo in the local sphere. And I'd like you to share, oh, welcome, Amon Kondro. I would like you to share with us as a department, what kind of challenges are you confronted with when you have to deal with this informal sector within our municipalities? You know, in terms of the smaller, small businesses that we are we are trying to bring up, you know, what kind of challenges that you are confronted with, and what kind of work can we, as as members of parliament, 
who is working, who are actually staying in these areas, who are actually uh, residents of these municipalities, where we can actually strengthen your hand and making sure whatever you want to achieve as a department, you are able to achieve so that you are not blamed for things that is out of your control. Thank you very much. Those are my questions. Thank you very much. I recognize Member Mvind. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Just a follow up on the previous question I've asked on the terms of leases. Now, on terms of lease, the land lease. Now, I know after 94, one of the challenges that was faced by the new democratic government was the previous leases that were signed 90, for 99 years. You know, and it has always been a battle in, uh, to to deal with those leases, and some of them were just done for the sake of doing them, just to frustrate the transformation process, so that people are there for 99 years. There's nothing you can do about it. But now, also, we've learned in the process that there is something in law called notarial deeds that we are allowed in terms of leasing government land for not more than 10 years because it says there's something in the notarial deeds act that says that uh, you must do it for 19 for nine years 9.8 or 9.9 .9 years otherwise the notarial deed does not allow you to do 10 years so i just want to know whether how legal it is now to do these leases for 10 years is it actually sustainable to do it for more than 10 years, for 99 years. I am not beginning to just empower one person forever while there might be a lot of others who would like to have these opportunities. If you are you lock this for 99 years, I think uh, I, I think even among us, uh, I think there'll be very few who will live for 99 years, you know. So I just want to check on the legalities of that because I knew it used to pose problems. Then the two general questions before, uh, maybe to the minister and the OHOD to maybe reflect on it. This, uh, the, the job for growth, or growth <laughs> for jobs, <laughs> yeah. No, it's because I know sometimes in growth, they can also be jobless growth as well. You know? So it's a funny thing we've learned in economics that I've always thought that with growth comes growth. I never knew that there can be jobless growth. You know? So how effective has it actually been, you know, this concept for this growth for jobs? You know, is it really begun to realize uh, fruit? Because I know in economics there is also something you you can uh, have jobless growth. It related to the township economy or development of townships, there is a very uh, worrying trend that is coming out in township, especially relating to spazas, spaza shops, you know. Right through the country, everyone is complaining now about the dominance of foreigners in this in that sector, actually, of spaza shops. And of course, the Western Cape is not excluded from that. Have you been like I know in other provinces there? seriously grappling with it and they are actually trying ways to try and deal with it. Has there been any efforts in the Western Cape to try and and deal with this challenge? And even begin to check as to part of the challenge will be to find out why are our people not interested in the spaza shops anymore? Because when I grew up, I actually grew up on the on spaza shop buying on the shop next door. You no. Know? Now it's been uh, overtaken by Foreigners, why are our locals not interested in running these shops anymore? Maybe that should be a research on its own that the department must actually conduct, having got at the outcome and see how we can actually begin to 
ignite interest to the people that to actually go back to to that because there's a recent uh, study that has been released that shows that in fact uh, there are a lot of benefit in running uh, a spaza shop because it actually supplies basics in the in the in, in the area now then if i come more specific then uh Jefferson, i think on page 40 of west Pro, there is a, you know there is a, a report that says that uh, there's been 19 black owned wine labels at vine vine expo in new york that's what we check how has maybe if we can just be feeling more how is that progressing because we know that industry has been exclusively white it's now quite encouraging if the department is beginning to encourage uh, uh, black people to get involved in that industry if you can just maybe you can share us some uh, experiences how is it progressing the last question chairperson will be on uh, I, I think also relating to west road page 60 that's to do with a uh, media and film production there is a uh, about it says there's a um, 21 page 60 yeah are we not dealing with west Coast? can i yeah? we're not dealing with west Coast yet we're only dealing oh, okay. with um no, fine. i've did that thank you I think um, I'd, I'd be more comfortable if we finish up this round. Um, we're going into Wesco next. Uh, members, any final questions for the... Okay, fantastic. Member Nkondlo, welcome. Thank you, Chaperson, and uh, good morning, colleagues and everybody in the, in the chamber. Uh, I just wanted to make a, a thank you for the responses uh, regarding, particularly on the SMME data, I want to appreciate I think the work that the colleagues have indicated, because obviously, you know, it's one thing to talk about intense and the good, um, noble ideas, but it's about how do we bring out, you know, evidence, uh, which is something I think as Member Seleko has indicated, that to look at numbers, we always must look at them in context. Uh, because when one speak about having achieved or overachieved, my question is always, you are achieving against what, you know? If you said you managed to have, let's say, a thousand SMMEs, how many SMMEs are there? You know, um, uh, so I think I want to appreciate the work that you are doing with. I think that was the GEM report that I was uh, referring to. So I think that would really have help. And I think the concept, Minister, and the HOD of disaggregating data has become very important because aggregation, one of the things that we've seen in the world, we talk about things that we assume is uh, facts but when we come to lived experiences of people because what we don't disaggregate them people just became a statistic and a number so i'm very happy with the narrative that we always talk about which is backed by evidence that western cape has got clean audits and these clean audits must really propel the western cape economy to operate differently it can't just be enough to always compare western cape economy with economies of other provinces that are not necessarily working because i mean that's actually comparing apples and oranges because you must be compared um with the requisite province that is actually uh, um, uh, performing in the same level so I'm, I'm really appreciating i think that evidence data particularly on smmes and issues of jobs because issues of jobs also will i think lead to what a member um, vimbi was speaking about around distant jobs because it's one thing to talk about jobs actually if you know now we're sitting in the uh, space of bpo that is the call centers if you can talk to young people that are in that space they are earning i think anything actually below 10000 rands and if you consider what are their costs in that 10 10000 rand cost of transport instability of taxes at at the end of the day i mean they don't have any what you would term a living wage so it's like a keep busy because they need a job, they go to work, but at the end of the day, it doesn't make them economically 
viable and active. So I think those are questions that I'm very much comfortable to deal with them with your department, because that this department is economic development by mandate, and therefore it must be preoccupied with that. The the one issue I wanted to, to, to check with the SMME booster fund, now that we're talking about data and evidence, is that Given that this program started in 2019, and once again, one appreciates that, I think with also the the, the standing committee uh, appealing for this program to be extended, I think the department um, also took that opportunity and the program, we are still seeing it. Since 2019, and I think it's about three, four years now, are we already going to start seeing impact evaluation of this program so that we start um, with the numbers that you're talking about can see because your approach is an intermediary approach. You are not necessarily dealing directly with the entrepreneur. So we need to know. And I think as um, I, I, I think the colleague was indicating that you need the data that tells you the before and after of these SMEs. So I'm interested to know whether is there an impact evaluation that has been done, which can be shared with us, or is there a process that is going to start looking at the impact uh, evaluation uh, of this uh, uh, department? My other uh, question to, to 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 the department, I think it's around the issues of port, and um, I'm raising it, Chair, because I think it also links to Saldana IDZ uh, around the question of um, uh, poor or dilapidating uh, infrastructure within a uh, uh, transnet. And considering that, um, I think one of the things that is raised as a concern in the, um, they call it Freeport, I still call it Saldan. Um, I'll still going to try and get my head around uh, uh, the terminology. I'm no longer young, so I can't keep everything in my head. So pardon me for that. So I just wanted to check because one of the things that they raise as a concern is that obviously there isn't any compelling, let's say, um, compacting or agreement. You you will always have a gentleman's engagement between yourselves and 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 Transnet, obviously for obvious reasons. So I'm trying to understand what conversations as a department are you having to try and deal. I I I saw I think in the in the in the IDZ that they even are talking about potential. I think uh, of uh, I think the North Precinct uh, within um, uh, the IDZ uh, to try and and optimize a, a space. So I'm trying to understand how is the department assisting. I know that we've got a visit to the port, I think sometime uh, in the coming weeks, and I'm sure we'll ask that particular question there. My last one uh, for this round, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that we're only three questions. My last one uh, on, on, on this round is whether the department is interfacing with the provincial treasury's procurement uh, office especially around uh, looking at how public procurement is also utilized as a lever for economic participation. And I'm raising this because the procurement office uh, resides with provincial treasury. Um, and yes, they are indicating good work that they're doing there to ensure that they share information, people are aware, and they can actually uh, participate in a uh, government uh, procurement opportunities. So what, what, what kind of a linkage between economic development that is structured that uh, I, you are having with the provincial trips? Thank you very much. Thank you, members. Any last questions? I see none. I do have just one question on my side, um, noting time constraints. With regards to page 144, um, I was interested in the job evaluations that have been introduced. Uh, I see that it still looks like it's ongoing. Um, there are a lot of uh, dotted lines um, with missing information. And so I just wanted to understand um, when will the other skills levels be assessed? Um, why only a part of the skills levels um, have been um, assessed, particularly the highly skilled supervision? And what were the outcomes of the evaluations to date? Anything positive, anything negative, any lessons learned? With that, I'll hand over to the department. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Uh, quite a number of questions. I will do our best to get through them all. Um, 
starting with Honorable van der Westhuizen. Uh, absolutely. Um, construction approvals uh, are uh, very often a stumbling block in the development of construction, which is a, a job creator in the province. So we fully agree with your assessment. Um, maybe just more broadly, uh, what we're trying to do is shift from red tape reduction to ease of doing business. So while red tape reduction in and of itself is a very important tool, so that's a kind of case by case basis where a particular company or individual has a, a problem that we help to unblock and to resolve. Um, what those complaints also do is they give us some insight into what some of the systemic challenges are in um, an ease of doing business sort of way. So instead of only just dealing with that specific complaint, we're looking at system-wide what some of those blockages are and then trying to resolve it system-wide so that we can develop an ease of doing business approach. So it's that kind of mindset, sh mindset shift or shift in how we're doing our things that um, we're moving towards that ease of doing business approach. So for example, we would have received many complaints about blockages in construction permitting. And so now what we're doing is we've developed a, um, we're creating a development permitting ease of doing business project to help that broadly speaking across municipalities. Um, at the same time, we also recognize that there are growth opportunities in the Western Cape at this point in time, which I think the census has uh, confirmed. Um, and so how do we then ensure that with this growth opportunity that we have at this point in time, that these kind of red tape issues don't then become blockages to doing business? So maybe if I could just ask um, John again, <laughs> you're, you're in the hot seat today, just to talk about the um, development permitting um, project that we're busy with. Yeah, th thank you very much. Um, and and I will I will start off and I'll hand over to the to the resident expert Michelle. She's online, but let me just start off with this uh, with that with regard to that question. And I think what we've done is over the years, you know, since we started the PDI process, we involved the the private sector and especially the the Western Cape Property Developers Forum, okay, in giving us insights into problems or challenges that they face. And this has been quite instrumental in us helping or working with the city to improve their processes, okay? So what we've then also done is we've embarked on a process and you'll see we spend quite, we're spending quite a lot of money on municipalities in terms of development permitting. Now, when we talk about development permitting, we don't only mean building plan approvals. We talk about from the time the land is identified to it being rezoned, to it being approved. So we've been done quite a lot of work with regard to, with regard to that one. We're working very close with what we call the regulators, as an example, with the with the Heritage Western Cape. Okay, how they improve their processes. Remember, anything over 60 years triggers a heritage, and that just puts puts a puts a bit of a span in the works. So we worked with them, and a lot has been done in improving their processes. This year, we took the entire unit and put them through a lean management course so that they can look at how they can improve their processes. But um, I'm going to hand over to my esteemed colleague, Michelle Ellis. She's the director for rate of reduction, and she will give you some insight with regard to what we're doing in the municipalities. And I'm sure to address your, your concerns. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, John. Tree. Um... To answer the question and to add on to what Minister and John explained, develop, development is more than just building plans. So like John said, there's the heritage component, there's the environmental impact assessments, land use components, and it can trigger um, approvals across all three spheres on, of government. Unfortunately, the municipalities get the bad rap because they give the final approval for building plans, which is usually the end process. Um, on the collection of stats specifically, we do look at uh, municipalities we've supported in the past with digitization to look at how um, um, turnaround times have been improved. Furthermore, Department of Environmental Affairs and Development Planning, they also undertake an annual survey to understand the challenges. Then municipalities are also required to report to National Treasury and COPTA in terms of Circular 88 and specifically on the number of plans as well as turnaround times. So municipalities are reporting on quite a number of forums around um, the turnaround times and performance in terms of building plans. Um, this year, we are rolling out a project um, with 
four municipalities around de development permitting. Stellenbosch is one of the big ones because last year we did we first undertook a business process improvement, a business process assessment um, exercise where we spoke to businesses in the area or developers in the area to understand their challenges. We then looked at the system that the, that Stellenbosch is using, and now we are um, implementing a number of amendments in order to improve the system. But this is also taking into account that there are a number of staff challenges in municipalities. Um, then we also identified Mossel Bay as well as Swartland and Hisakwa. Um, and the projects, it's, it's around system improvements, it's around um, integration as well as GIE systems, because these are the systems that improve or, fast, or ensures faster decision making by officials. Then also on construction, um, construction approvals or helping um, construction companies, etc. I think Program 2 also partners with the Department of Infrastructure with the Emerging Contractor Development Program together with organizations such as the CIDB, etc. to take them through not only the compliance related stuff, but also the business support um, information out there. Thank you. I think I'll stop at that. Thank you, Chair. Mm. Thanks very much, Michelle. Uh, then, um, Acting Chair, <laughs> uh, your question on green hydrogen. Uh, Joe, if you just want to give sketch the context on, on how it fits in with the energy crisis and how we marry the two. Uh, okay, there's a, a lot to say about green hydrogen, but I, I'll focus just on the specific question that you, you asked, Honourable Member. So uh, green hydrogen actually is going to help us uh, address the energy crisis for a variety of reasons. So one, uh, through green hydrogen investments, it actually starts to make other uh, more direct energy uh, projects uh, more viable um, because it adds scale to it. So for example, any upgrades to the transmission lines will be buffered and strengthened uh, because of the, the, the additional requirement for hydrogen. Secondly, what green hydrogen uh, provides in terms of the green energy is, is that they would provide for excess. So they would cater because of the requirements of uh, the processes. They will be generating more electricity than they will actually use. So actually what it does is that it contributes towards our own ener energy needs. Um, and then, of course, how additionally it will help us, it will help us uh, meet our climate goal, uh, our climate change goal standards and aims, uh, and then it, uh, effectively help support our jobs and the growth of our industries, particularly for those export markets, which are starting to introduce uh, carbon border adjustment mechanisms. So it's, it's going to help us save those jobs, um, including new opportunities like green steel, et cetera, et cetera. But as far as the energy crisis is concerned, it's going to help us rather than uh, detract from it. Thanks. Apologies, Chair. If we could just go back to the previous question. Uh, Ilza, um, I think there was a contribution you wanted to add. Not a problem. Thank you very much. Um, acting or Member van der Westhuizen, with regards to the incentive program, so at a municipal space, they usually have an incentive policy, which they then provide. And in the Western Cape, there's only two municipalities that have that in place. One is City of Cape Town and the other one is George Municipality. Um, and like very much what you were mentioning in terms of is it that we know what assets we have available that we could unlock for investment opportunities. And that's a lot of a work that we're now undertaking and it'll be a bigger focus in next year uh, with regards to investment readiness at a municipal level because they've got certain things that they can leverage and uh, that that's quite necessary for the investment space. So City of Cape Town, we had a, a meeting with an investor yesterday where we were referring to them in terms of certain um, Prescripts that would could help this particular. It's quite a large, it's a billion rand investment with regards to a particular industrial area, which they can then get access to incentives, whether it's from an energy space or rate rebate, et cetera, et cetera. 
it's not um, widely popular in South Africa. Certain municipalities you can afford it because it has a cost bene- uh, cost implication, and um, definitely it's it's. But it's also about um, similar to what the investor was saying to us yesterday, is they just need assistance in terms of investment facilitation, whether it's through a West Grows one stop shop, whether it's through Invest Cape Town, etc. That's part of the the support that you need to provide. Um, for an investor. So from a, a bylaw perspective or incentive scheme, it's only George and, and Cape Town at this stage. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, then moving over to uh, Honourable Selector's question. Um, skills. Oh, skills. Okay, go ahead. Um, I think we still have a question that uh, uh, Acting Chair asked, which relates to skills and our interface with the uh, FET colleges. And particularly, our engagement with the Minister Nzemande. Um, uh, our skills uh, expert recently had an engagement with Mr. Nzemande. Maybe he can comment on, on that question. Nizam? Thank you, Minister. Thanks, HD. So, there were, there were two, two, two questions, two or three questions on skills. The first is uh, uh, the member asked about the Tewood Colleges. Uh, thank you, uh, Member Chair. Um, and I think the first is that you are right. Um, our, the bar for TVET colleges in this country may be very, very low, but we do boast some of the best TVET colleges in the country, notwithstanding that the bar uh, uh, is low. And we also recognize that there's a misalignment between academic instruments, uh, products that's produced at the TVET colleges and what uh, industry require, and also the modality in which they deliver, um, industry finds it particularly challenging. Um, We are moving to a dual vocational model, which is um, developed along the same lines as a German vocational, and that will be developed through the the new QCTO, where all occupations at Tivert Colleges now has an experiential learning component. Um, Notwithstanding, there's still severe challenges in that particular space, specifically from an academic instrument perspective. Um, And that's one of the reasons that the department produces between four and five new academic instruments per year. It's not our mandate, it's difficult for us to do it, but we work with universities, with colleges in developing those instruments that better align to industry demand. One of them is the PV installer, which we developed last year. I think it was in this year's APP. Um, we saw a gap in the market. Um, we know that uh, PVs, this province has the highest rate of PV installations. We don't have the qualifications, uh, so we developed um, th- those ones. We also recognize that um, we need to work on a system that autocorrects itself. Um, and in that regard, in bringing about a system that autocorrects, uh, we chair the first TVIT forum where uh, we chair all the TVITs, um, and we're also the first um, CETA TVIT forums. Now, it's important to note the, the role that the CETAs play because the qualifications actually is owned by the CETAs and, and not the TVITs. Um, so if you want to develop a new qualification, it's the CETA that owns that qualification. Um, so that CETA TVIT forum provides um, uh, that bridge between what industry requires and uh, and what's uh, produced by the TVET colleges. Um, with respect to the comment around, should we speak to Minister Zamandi? Uh, yes, we do. So there's an HRDC, Human Resource Development Council, and we represent the Premier on that. The department represents the Premier on that council every quarter. And lots of our challenges uh, we, we we raise there. That particular forum is chaired by the Deputy President <clears throat> and the two key members is basic ed, uh, the Minister of Basic Education and, and Higher Education. I'm also pleased to announce that uh, last year we launched the first BPO Academy. So in this particular province, we know the BPO sectors experience significant growth. Um, as a department, we always look at innovative ways for the system to um, respond to that demand and not for the department to spend its money in developing skills for that. So we've uh, 
convinced the Department of Higher Education that in this province we need an academy specifically for BPO, and then over time it will wean our support in that sector once that um, um, uh, um, academy is up and running. Then with respect to um, the BPO and BPO growth, um, I think, uh, Minister, I think the first is, um, yes, you are right. We have experienced significant growth. But there's a few numbers I think you may want to consider when you're only um, in addition to the salaries. Every offshore BPO job in the Western Cape contributes 350,000 rand of foreign revenue into the province. So it's not only those BPO jobs, it's also real estate, the cleaners, the IT, logistics, and everything that goes with it. Um, so the 70,000 jobs implies that it contributes at about 2.24 billion to the Western Cape economy, which makes it as large, if not larger, than the tourism sector in this economy in terms of um, economic impact. The, the roles that we support in this particular sector. It's not, you know, when we think about call centers, we think someone is calling and annoying the crap out of you when you are trying to have dinner at six o'clock with your family. But the type of um, uh, complex work that we develop here is we produce IT support to the telecom equivalent in Australia, legal processing to the rest of the world. If you call Amazon in English, German and Polish, all of those calls are here. Finance jobs, logistics jobs, the the lubrication for the tourism sector, those particular BPO jobs are all service here. They're highly complex work. If you think of a company like State Street that provides banking services to the banking world, no one thinks of State when you think about bank, you think about Barclays or City, but you've got companies like State Street that provides the plumbing for that particular industry. Those jobs historically was all done from here, and those are all regarded as BPO jobs. My last comment on that, um, the, the salaries, the average salaries is just over 10,000 rand, you, you're right. But we have 800,000 unemployed individuals roughly in this particular province. 50% of them don't even have matric. Now, this particular industry allows those individuals to transition into uh, um, employment. And I think at the cost, our cost of 15,000 rand a job makes this particular sector one of the cheapest sectors in absorbing young kids uh, in employment. Thank you, uh, Minister. Thank you. May I just uh, highlight that this has also been live streamed on YouTube. So even though you want to describe the level of irritation that you experience when people phone you at six o'clock at night, please just uh, be careful that this is public. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, then uh, moving on to Honourable Sileko's question around the booster fund and um, our support to entrepreneurs and some of the faces. Um, I mean, I fully take the point. It's a bit difficult within a regulated annual report in what and how much we can show what that means tangibly and for the individuals um, involved and in those that benefit. Um, so maybe what we could do is invite the committee to come and meet some of the beneficiaries of the SMME Booster Fund. And it's not only that, we also support, for example, tourist guides. And those are entrepreneurs. Uh, that once they get the accreditation will be starting their own business in the tourism industry. And so all of those faces and spaces I think would be nice for the committee to to see and to meet. So for example, uh, last year the HOD and I were at um, uh, an event where we had um, small businesses in the food and beverage industries in rural areas that had benefited via the booster fund. And there were some remarkable innovations uh, there was a young lady, for example, that uh, that takes um, fein boss and bakes bread with the fein boss, and it's got a particular uh, aroma to it. It's absolutely delicious, and it's something that she developed herself and has now started her own business, and she now has her own food truck to be able to do that. And there were several businesses that uh, that were enabled through those food truck. Uh, for that food truck um, initiative, and those are all in rural areas. Um, you know, the informal sector as well, e-commerce, on bicycles, 
uh, which is something we launched earlier this year. All of these are the kind of stories of individuals that you'll find within within the space. So the question is, how do we then relay that information to the committee in a better way that can show the kind of impact? Um, I don't know, uh, John, if you want to talk a little bit more about you know, what does it mean tangibly for individuals and, and small businesses to have this kind of support? Yeah, thank you, uh, Minister. Maybe just to tie into the Minister and just the nature of the booster fund is that we obviously don't work with individual businesses, but we impact on them directly. So so what I did was I, I took, uh, took an example of a fund or, or support that we provided, and I thought, you know, the analogy of the starfish. And I, and I looked at it and I said, you know what, uh, the, the difference that we made to Asanda of Amazing here in Bukweni by providing blow drying, air drying stands and a generator and wash basins. The difference we made to John Bradley in terms of his desk coffee shop, also in power with a donut machine and a donut mixer. And then we look at pans of, of Pana Kitchen, we provided an ice cream machine, gas blower, deep freeze, and then also tables. And then lastly, to Landawa, where we provided overlocking machines, plain sewing machines, scissors, cutting table to a, a business in Bukweni. So so, so the numbers, the, the stats that are there, behind that sits a lot of names. And lot, I might not give you the pictures now, but I gave you some of the names. And what the minister has said there, we've, we've to, to put that, that picture, uh, that names to the or the, or the or the images to the names. We've arranged a session, and Minister, I don't know to what extent we can open it up. But on the 15th of of November, we are having a session in at our labs in Mitchell's Plain, where we're getting the 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 booster fund participants in in one room and just basically saying thank you to them, so we can actually see who these people are. So so we do actually record it because we want to see differences in the in the lives that we make in these people. Sorry, Chidwa, this stuff it continue on. If I may also, Member Suleko, say we, we do uh, accept uh, the, the invitation to invite you to be with us when you go to municipalities and see what sort of support you, you can provide. We'll take you up on that. Um, Minister Member? I was just saying the invite has, from the department noted. Perhaps we can mark it down as a resolution. Thank you, <laughs> Member. Uh, thank you. Then, um, Honourable Mvimbi, uh, you made an important point that there is such a thing as jobless growth. And of course, we were very mindful of that when we were crafting the strategy. Uh, and um, it's very, it comes up very clearly that, uh, and we made the point that the kind of growth is as important as the growth itself. Uh, and we've because we know that uh, South Africa's growth so far has been insufficient to create the kind of employment that we need to really tackle uh, unemployment levels. So uh, that's why our vision for growth for jobs is to create a jobs rich, thriving, inclusive and resilient rental economy. So all of the programs and projects are then designed to make sure that that growth is um, labor absorptive uh, to, to deliver on our vision. <clears throat> Then uh, there was a question. Okay, do you want to take that? You can ask the SCZ to talk to the uh, legality of the uh, of the uh, the leases. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the the um, the clause and the, the 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 law that you had cited does not apply to us because uh, as an entity that is our business of leasing on land. So uh, that uh, firstly, but I, I want to strategically also just add to that, that uh, with the level of investments that we are attracting, um, the private sector requires security of tenure and to have a payback of that level of infrastructure investment, they would seek, I, I would think, minimum of 15 years. Um, 20 years, 25 years, depending on that infrastructure investment. So therefore, we have developed uh, and entered into different kinds of lease terms with the private sector to ensure that they have that security and that confidence to make the investment following. Thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, Honourable Mayor. Let me just to also add to that is um, there is a an important part of the process of landing an investor into a special economic zone um, that brings investment and it brings jobs directly. But an important part of what 
uh, we do as an SEZ as, uh, and the Freeport Saldana is that we look for all the knock-on opportunities that surround that particular investor landing. So it may be an international company landing in an SEZ or the Freeport and, and building up its factory. But around that are input suppliers that are required, there's logistics, there's a whole range of other opportunities which can be actively nurtured and created, if you like, um, and businesses built to take advantage of that. And so you can grow, you can actively grow the impact of, of that investment into the surrounding community and into the broader economic value chain. And that's an important part of the strategy uh, that is followed and, and, and adopted as well. So I think it expands and creates more opportunities than just that, that direct investment itself. Um, and so it's a it's a good way of 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 not just relying on the on the single investment. Thank you. Then um, the next question was to Westgrow uh, regarding uh, the entity support to black wine growers and uh, black wine makers. Um, perhaps if Westgrow could take that question and um, perhaps also talk about yeah. the ARC project. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, thank you, um, Minister. Um, so I wonder if the committee is aware that um, there's a hub in Stellenbosch called Wine Arc, and in Stellenbosch there are 13 black-owned um, brands. Um, the black label, the black-owned brands that we took to the US, um, we took them to um, the Vin Expo in New York. I'll just list some of the some of the names of the companies. It's a uh, Ashina Wines, Carmen Stevens Wines. Uh, I can't understand my own handwriting here. Let me just go to the text again. Um, give me one second. Uh, Exco, there we go. Um, I just want to give you some of the names so that you can just get a feel for. Um, so it's Aslina Wines, Carmen Stevens Wines, Kai Wines, Sesfakile Wines, Tokazana Wines, The Bridge of Hope Wines, Klein Goederist Wines, La Rikmal Wines, Pardon, Kloof Wine Estate, Rockbelt Ridge Wines, Bayedi Royal Wines, Coney Wines, Highbury Wines. So this is just a couple of the, the black-owned wine labels um, that we took to um, took to the U.S. Um, and... Uh, in, in the Western Cape, we also have the Wine Tourism Ambassador Awards and two of the black-owned wine labels took two of the awards. So I think that's, you know, there's there certainly is um, a growing um, interest, um, you know, in, in, in the sector and specifically in the U.S. The U.S. like to, the diaspora like to buy from black-owned businesses. So we're finding that there's, you know, there's there's been quite a lot of growth in, in that area. Right now, we've also got a Made in the Cape Expo um, at the waterfront, and there are a few um, black-owned wine labels um, uh, there as well. So I've got a whole nother story to tell you, but I'll I'll leave it there. <laughs> If we could just maybe go for, 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 for this one. There's a question around the research on the spazas. Um, John, if you could okay. take that question and maybe at the same time respond to the question on um, public procurement. Uh, do you have a structured way or structured discussions with PT? If you could take those those two questions, John. Um, procurement same. Okay. Sorry? Procurement same percentage. Yeah, procurement. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Th thank you. Um, uh, okay, then just to, re to respond then to, to, the, to the balance of those questions, the one is the, the, the challenges that we experience or we get reported in terms of the informal sector, especially maybe in the non-rural areas. Look, um, at, at again, it at, at ranges from the, the, the sort of um, across the board crime and, and, and extortion to, to permitting, okay, and then also in, in most cases, access to support services. Now, now you know that in government support services you require certain sort of things like tax clearance and stuff like that. So even with the national incentives. So what we try and do is, and again, years years we 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 form the relationship. For example, with the with the DSBD is to work with them to actually get the increase in an uptake of those incentives. Okay, for the for the informal sector. That's the one thing. Then we've got quite a good relationship with SAITA, which is the South African Informal Traders Association, and they would 
periodically report to us any issues with red tape related issues where it comes to municipalities with permitting and stuff like that. So we try and keep our ear quite close to the ground to listen to what is actually happening there. But I would say, in a nutshell, then the, the the sort of challenges facing these businesses: number one, obviously the safety issue; number two, uh, 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 um, I would say infrastructure, and then and then access to support services, especially access to finance. We, look, we obviously not uh, not able to solve everything, but in the in the non-metro areas, what we tried to do was, and with our with our um, with a booster fund, we've rolled out about 13 trading hubs. Okay, so if you go down, um, what's it, Lanesburg Main Road, you see on the right hand side as you come in, there's a, there's a hub that we established with the municipality. And I think I can't remember, Auntie, there's an auntie that makes fed cook there that used to stand on the side of the road, but she's actually in there. So what we try and do in terms of, of the infrastructures, do something like that, right? So that's how we try and sort that, those ones out. Then the other question maybe linked to that uh, is on the Spaza shops. And again, having a chat to, to an expert, and you were saying that, look, the Spaza shops is basically now 99% dominated by, by, by foreigners, okay? It's an intricate system of ordering. It's an intricate system of, of, um, of, of how they do business. Which, which is unparalleled by the locals, okay? Just remember these these people are prepared to sit up later. They prepare to sit in the shop whole day, whereas locals are saying, listen, weekend, close up shop. They need to go wherever they need to go. So these guys, that's, I think it's almost typical immigrant type of approach. We, we, that's the only life that they know, and they dominate in that way. And also they've got an extensive network in terms of buying things up, right? Like I think uh, the guy was saying that yesterday, a lot of, because of crime also. I think there was a, in Kailicha, there was about three three major wholesalers owned by Chinese, but because of crime, they're gone and because obviously of the kidnapping. But what basically then happens is that the other foreigners take over these things. So the foreigners have taken over the entire supply chain. Okay, from the from the big stores, right? Or or the or the warehousing right down to the actual retail. You see it in the in the in the C B D. If you go down any of these roads here, you'll see uh, sort of call it warehouses and that sort of dominated by foreigners so it's very difficult to do that so how are we getting around that one and 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 just maybe to touch on to my colleague uh, nizam what we're trying to do is we're going to try and roll that project out next year is to is to partner with the with the with the with the t vets especially in the township so for next year we, ident we there's a de identification of three of three t vets the one is going to be that covers kailicha garden route and then atlantis and then also in the west coast where, the, where these hubs are going to be used for entrepreneurship development, not only for the students completing plumbing or panel beating, but also community members who want to upskill. So the guy who's doing the welding, we want to pull him into the college to be able to be trained to do better welding and to improve his business. So the way you get around that is to actually give the locals skills which they can use to start a decent business. OK, we're not going to take away that spaza shop is a very difficult thing, but I think getting around that would be to 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 install some sort of skill sets for for, for our locals, especially for our our, our youth. OK, um, then the other question was um, uh, achievement against what? I think it was a uh, member in Kondlo asked that question. Yes, very good question. Um, what we are, are going to be embarking on next year is an independent evaluation by by Treasury to do an expenditure review. Same like they did, like they did with, uh, with with skills, where we get them in to look at the, 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 the money that we spent over the four or five years and look at what the impact has been. So in that way, we get an independent evaluation. At the moment, we can report back to you and say, of the 20 businesses that we've started, uh, 20 or 80% of them have, them have actually increased their turnover. But we would, in this case, because PT will be doing it, it will be done in, independently. OK, then, then the other question on on procurement. Now, I think procurement as as, a, as an enabler. And if you look at the Gauteng a township strategy and also certainly within within our city, uh, 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 um, procurement can be is an enabler, especially for your for your for your smaller ended business. OK, so what we're doing with and, and this is part of, of our sort of transversal approach. We started last two years ago working with not only with PT, but also with Department of Human Settlements and then also Public Works in terms of the contract development programs. Because what happens is that there's many small jobs, especially in the in the non-metro areas, that actually goes to smaller businesses because there's a requirement for that. So we're working with them on that one. So 
just specifically on PT. PT is, is going to be part of what we call a, a SMME forum that is going to be all the departments and looking at how we support those 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 SMEs, which in effect, uh, members, are about supply development. How do we develop our own supplies that are supplying government, okay, and expand also on that one. So that we're going to be doing on on, on, on an enterprise uh, component. And also we're going to look at, at, at working with them in terms of lean management to see how we can improve the processes and also make it easier for SMMEs to access tenders. So there's a two-pronged approach. Number one, make it easier for 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 um for uh, SMEs to access tenders. And the second part then is to build capacity with uh, with uh, with uh, with, uh, with the SMMEs. Just the last one on that, uh, I just I don't have feedback on that one, but we have been approached by one of the banks where they would provide almost soft type of finance to 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 black owned smmes who will access tenders from government so we're still looking into that we would like to check how that one works if we can get that done we'll see how we can actually get more of the banks involved in that one because as you know uh for smmes especially from your from your disadvantaged areas and you're not and your rural areas access to finance is always a problem um so i think that that covers in the questions we thanks thanks john um the Lex question relates to IDZ or Freeport Saldana um, and the relationship with the TNPA. Can I have that over to, to you, uh, Sean? Yeah, well, thank you. Um, so within the Freeport, um, we've utilized, if I can may perhaps speak firstly in terms of the year under review and, and the report that's tabled. So during the year under the review, under review, um, we have reached out to TNPA uh, to discuss and raise a new way of working together in a more cooperative, more binding way, taking due respect and acknowledgement of the mandates that we have from the SEZ Act and our own legislation, but also that TNPA have under the Ports Act. And to really find an elegant, suitable, mutually beneficial way that we can do what we need to do in terms of our mandates and our necessary functions, but that don't undermine our planning and our strategic goals that we have as the two entities and the responsibilities that we have. That work after the year under review is still underway. There has been some traction of late, I will say, uh, to finding a way forward. Um, uh, there's more open-mindedness uh, in looking at ways that we can figure this out together within the governance and legal frameworks that we have. Nothing, it's not concluded, which is a bit of a frustration. And hence, you know, it has a very direct impact on what we call the turnover of our investment pipeline into operating businesses who employ people. So, um, I think for the outlook for, for next year is very critical for us to secure those compacts and not only those compacts, but those commercial arrangements that will give that confidence to the private sector to come in into the port and into the free port um, as well. Jay, thanks. The, it was the last question um, that related to page 144 on job evaluation. If I could ask uh, Cheryl uh, to talk to that question, please. Um, thank you, Chair. So in relation to the job evaluation questions, posts can be evaluated in three instances. So one being every six months, um, 60 months in terms of the public service regulation. The second one would be where posts are being advertised. And the third one is when we're doing an organizational um, review or, re or redesign. So in these instances, it is in relation to the um, 60 months um, review process that is required. Um, the, the other question about the outcome, the outcome can be cited on page 145. And it indicates none of these posts were either upgraded or downgraded um, in table 332. Um, and in with relations to all the others, we, we spoke about the blank pages, is um, during the organizational review process, the others will take place. So it will take in the form of that um, category. Thank you so much. 
So just just to for Member Gondo, just to be sure that your specific question was definitively answered, that uh, SMM booster will be evaluated next year. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I have received a request to take a short um, breather. Um, I'm going to ask that we please come back by 10 past, 15 past absolute latest, um, and then we'll jump straight into Whisker. All right. Thank you, everyone.
Don't you mind moving a bit closer to us? We won't bite, I promise. I was remiss in not calling for any public input earlier, so I just wanted to get a sense of whether there are any public uh, or members of the public who would like to ask a question or make a comment who are either online or in person. I see none. With that, um, I will now hand over to the Minister and her department to give an overview for West Group for the 22-23 um, annual report. With that, I'll hand over to the Minister. Thank you very much, Chair. I think let's just go straight into the uh, West Group annual report. We have already uh, glowed about the uh, turnaround in the uh, audit results of the entity. But uh, far beyond that, uh, some very good work done, and uh, we'd be very happy to take the members' questions uh, in respect to the performance of, of the entity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, with that, um, I just want to check, see, uh, CEO, would you like to say? Um, Chair, um, no, we're happy to take questions. Um, however, it's been a, it's been a long year, um, and uh, I do need to... Uh, definitely uh, commend or thank the department um, for the support that they provided us um, during this difficult time. PT and a whole, all the stakeholders that have helped us. So this is something that we've we've really really done together with a whole range of people um, supporting us. It's been a, a, a good year in terms of our performance as well. Um, so we would like to answer any questions that there may be. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, CEO. Members, are there any questions? If you could please raise your hands. I see Member van der Yes. Yes, I Good. Thank you very much and congratulations on, on your report and particularly the financial uh, results or the audit results. Um, just a few questions. The, the, I first want to congratulate you also on your little SWOT analysis, which was, if I read it correctly, to a large extent, an inward-looking uh, exercise in terms of what is West Grow strengths and so on. But then there are also what I would say 
a, a provincial uh, uh, or environmental, you know, if you look at the environment in which you operate, strengths and opportunities, etc. And one being, it seems that uh, we in the Western Cape, we are well endowed with wind and solar, uh, sunshine, um, and, and uh, we have a history of high tech and so on. So my questions relate to a few of those those aspects and those that know me quite often i'm i'm looking for things in annual reports and then i'm not seeing it there for example on page 43 you've got a beautiful picture of 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 the boat boat building industry but um, if i can believe my 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 computer uh, searching for the words boat or yacht i don't see uh, a single reference those words do not come up, and I do know in the in the past we've said that, you know, boat building, uh, boat maintenance, ship maintenance, and so on, because we are on the coast, because we've got a harbour, you know, these are all we've got we've got uh, well skilled labour uh, at 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 relatively low cost internationally. So perhaps if you could just say what happened to the previous initiative, to to particular ex uh, uh, support. The export of these these yachts and so on. I also, when I look at the global exports in 2022-2023, which is on pages 36, 37, and and onwards, I I do not see any reference to that. And I thought we were still quite invested in 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 that game. The other question that I have is on page 46, uh, 48. Sorry. Um, a year ago, I think we were still perhaps in the in the uh, COVID pandemic. There was talk of uh, a vaccine manufacturing entity being a uh, facility being established here in the in the Western Cape. Perhaps if you could just tell us, uh, you know, did it go further than just the announcement of that? Are, are we already in the production phase? Is it still in the implementation phase, or, or where where are we as far as that is uh, concerned? And then on page 60, where you uh, uh, quote in the film industry, for example, the number of full-time jobs. Now, we know that the film industry is also a, a project-driven driv industry. People come, they, they, they uh, work for three or months or six months, and then the product is complete. So perhaps if you could just help us to understand what is your definition then of a full-time equivalent job for how many months is it a full-time job for a year for 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 a one day you know perhaps because i do think it's it's significant uh, for me to understand what uh, that uh, how you define uh, full-time equivalent jobs thank you so much again thank you very much members any further questions i recognize member and control and then member Mbilid. No, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Let me also join member to appreciate the improvement in the audit of uh, Westgrow and uh, thank uh, the CEO uh, to steer the ship this time around and uh, can demonstrate that uh, when girls are on the driving seat, things do happen. No offense, no offense to boys. Please don't take, don't, <laughs> don't catch feelings. The intention is for not you to catch feelings, but just to state a fact. And I'm sure the, this annual report is telling. I mean, really. Um, uh, See, so if you can just um, indicate to me in page uh, 23, um, in terms of progress towards the achievement of institutional impacts and and and, and outcomes. I think uh, you do mention there um, the positive, uh, I think jobs and uh, the kind of uh, trade investment that uh, through your work as West Growth that you had, had done. Um, my, 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 my question here is that uh, from the agency's point of view, um, what is a methodology that you use to sort of measure and attribute your success and um, how can this be sort of uh, sustained 
um, particularly in the current uh, economic uh, climate, climate which is which is global. Um, notwithstanding, I think uh, one was reading uh, yesterday some World Bank uh, report that places South Africa to be turning a tide probably in the continent, which is good news if those predictions are, 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 are true. Uh, my, my 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 second question is on page uh, 40 uh, on the export promotion and i'm going back to your uh, black owned uh, wine labels um which i think are part of vinpro if i'm not mistaken as part of their industry transformation program now w w one of my um concerns about um you know trade promotion and which i understand that you may not necessarily be responsible to handhold uh, companies but having them attended these trade expos are you able or do you have information about orders because one thing that my understanding is is that people go to the trade expos with the intention to increase their balance sheet so it's one thing to go to the trip. It's one thing that, uh, you know, markets are um, excited about the story. And I'm raising this because, you know, at, at one point uh, here, I think in the last administration, I remember there was a DTIC actually went to East uh, Russia and they brought a, a buyer who was looking for wine in the province and um, DTIC actually even came to the Western Cape and was also intentional to try and get these uh, black women. And the unfortunate thing in the conversation with, um, with the buyer, they said, well and good, they like the story behind, you know, these uh, labels. But when it came to volumes um, of what is demanded there, also cost because the business model of these uh, uh, black, uh, black owned wine labels is actually that it's labeling. So there isn't value addition because they could go to the actual um, uh, wine or own those that are owning those brands and beat them on the price. Actually that's what happened. So by the time the buyer left here back to East Russia, that initiative by DTIC benefited not actually this um, uh, this uh, this latest. So it's the business model. It is not your problem as Westcro, but I'm just giving you context uh, that one thing that is always my frustration about this um, uh, initiative is that good as it is, it has those kind of challenges because even when they're sitting in the shelves in, in pick and pay or anywhere else, you know, between a bottled um, 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 what a Cabernet, obviously one would buy, you know, the brand that they know. So I'm asking the question here on this uh, uh, trade emission, do you know, do you have figures of out of the 19, how many have actually landed uh, clear orders uh, uh, from, 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 from the trip? And my last one is on the international delegations uh, uh, coming into the province. And I must say, just as a traveler or just as a citizen here, you know, when you pass, um, what is this, our ICC, and I like the fact that they're there, you know, from the N1, you can actually see expos and everything. I've never, since the time of COVID to date, there's actually almost every day something. The question that I always ask myself, and I remember I attended one which was more on the ICT they were doing in Africa, I think looking at uh, ICT businesses in the province. When I attended that, I found actually there were more um, non-South Africans, especially the new businesses that were pitching there than South Africans. Um, and I remember there was a, one young lady was from Stellenbosch who actually was one of the ones who actually won. The, the question now is, in these international um, um, opportunities that comes into our shores, how do we ensure that local businesses, you know, are also 
you know, roped in into those kind of opportunities, whether through expos or business um, trade conferences that come into into the province. How are we matching, you know, uh, these delegations coming here? Because I know sometimes they just do this on their own, using their own eventing companies, uh, who sometimes may not necessarily know the bigger networks of local uh, businesses. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much. I believe Member Mbimbi wanted to ask a question. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Two questions only from my side, Chairperson. On page uh, 60, uh, it's got to do with uh, the media and film production that has been realized. <coughs> it's quite remarkable. Actually, about, uh, it's there, it's about 15 of those, but then what is just uh, uh, I know that most of those uh, companies, uh, they are actually foreign companies. It's only two, three, if three that are South African. What might be the reason for that? Uh, really, that is all is actually predominantly a foreign. And I thought normally when we deal with issues of government, we are always open and transparent about issues. But then I see the the name of these companies is withheld. What might be the uh, the rationale behind that? Uh, why is it actually being confidential? Because we are talking about 3.79 billion, and then uh, and the people that are involved in that uh, business, we don't know who they are. You know, so what might be the reason behind that? That's my first question. And then second question is on page uh, 82. Or it's human resource, it's T. Uh, the reasons for staff leaving is 19, sorry, there's 11 resignation which amounts to 85%. What is the cause of this exodus of uh, these people living? You know, can we maybe be taken into confidence as to this high amount of people actually living there, the company? Thank you very much, Shepperson. Thank you very much. Members, are there any further questions? I see no further questions. Um, I'd like to just put forward some questions of my own. Um, firstly, just to the CEO's remarks, um, I was just curious in terms of um, staffing, what efforts were taken to bolster SEM finance and HR in your move towards an unqualified audit? Secondly, um, on page 79, it was noted that there are seven inf interns um, and I wanted to know what efforts are being taken to possibly onboard them um, and bring them on in a more formal capacity. And of those interns, um, I just wanted to also understand um, a bit more about the training that they received. I see approximately 147,000 Rand has gone into their training. So what does this include? How does this bolster them? And then lastly, pages 81 to 82 um, talks about uh, terminations, misconduct and disciplinary action. Um, if it's possible to understand what were the reasons behind that um, and the processes followed. With that, I'll hand back to the minister and to um, Wesker. Thank you. Apologies, I do see a late question from Member Seleko. No, no, Chair, my apologies. I was just uh, reading on page nine from the CEO, uh, thanking the one particular uh, municipality for the support. And I'm just wondering, uh, you know, when someone, I would like to sincere to the Premier is fine, the Minister is fine. And then you mentioned the city of Cape Town. And then I sit here as a rural person now, then I ask myself, you know, Oh, wow, wow. What is the relationship between West Goro and our rural municipalities? You know, because we we tend to almost like whenever you talk about uh, tourism, you'll find that tourism only happens in the city of Cape Town, and in we've got Overstrands, we've got Cape Gallus, so we've got 
a lot of municipalities, but we don't seem to find all these beautiful stories. And when you get to an annual report and then a CEO only mentions a mayor and a MMC of tourism, and then you wonder what is what's so special about them. You know, is there a specific reason why one would only mention two, whereas we've got 30 municipalities within the Western Cape. So I now just like to expand in terms of the relationship with our rural municipalities when it comes to to tourism, because uh, we've also got rural tourism, you know, and we've also would love to have events happening in our rural municipalities. We've got, we've got great facilities, but seemingly people don't want to come there, and one would always want to ask, what is what 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 is the reason? So I would just want people to explain to us in terms of thanks. Uh, thank you, Memo. I think part of the answer is in that they are a funder as well, but I'll hand back over. Thank you to the honourable members for the questions. Um, I think uh, although the questions are uh, quite specific, I think it might be helpful just to talk a little bit about the strategy uh, that we have in respect of how do we attract uh, tourists and investors into the Western Cape? What role does the Convention Bureau play in respect of those events at the CTICC? And although they might be international events, what is that contribution to potential investment uh, in the province further down the line? I think we've got a nice opening to talk about the Made in the Cape brand and um, the uh, matching that that platform does. Um, <clears throat> And uh, and then, of course, uh, tourism across the board, across the province, because they are fantastic stories right across the province. So, for example, recently, Plettenberg Bay was named as a World Whale Heritage Site, only one of nine in the world. Um, and um, we, um, we've seen, for example, the Roblox projects for the Karoo and so on. So there's lots of uh, different examples of how we support tourism across the mm -hmm. province, but I'll leave it to the entity uh, to get into the detail. Thanks. Um, thank you very much, Chi. Thank you, Minister. I think um, these are very, 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 very good, insightful questions. Um, and Member Nkondlo, um, thank you for recognising the role of women um, in the workplace. Um, I, I do appreciate that. And if you look around, you'll see that probably 50% of my team here are women too. No uh, disrespect to the gentlemen. But <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we're a proudly women team. So we... <laughs> Um, I would like to start with the with the with the the the, the question of the city of Cape Town and uh, why they are thanked um, in my um, uh, 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 statement. Um, the West Grow is the official tourism, trade, and investment pro promotion agency for Cape Town and the Western Cape. Um, so that is what is um, obviously defined in the Act. Um, in addition to that, uh, the city of Cape Town funds Westcrow to the tune of about 20 million, um, and and that tops the funding that we get from from DDAT. Um, with respect to the work that we um, do in in municipalities, uh, we have a. In fact, I just before. Um, before I started speaking, I actually said to the team that we do need to look at how the numbers that we have are disaggregated to the different um, districts. So we have got all of the data disaggregated to district level at the moment, and we're hoping to, in fact, go a little bit deeper. So even though we find that the investment numbers are very much focused on the city of Cape Town, um, the export numbers are very well spread across all of the districts. So if you look at um, if you look at the the, the, the pages, uh, I think it's 30, 36 to 39 in the annual report, then you will see that there's quite a good spread of exports from Cape Winelands, uh, West Coast, Cape Overberg, um, Garden Route, um, etc. So there's quite a good spread. Um, across um, all of the districts. Similarly, um, we have done um, quite a lot of work um, to also with the ship calls, um, with the Cruise Cape Town Initiative, we've also done a lot of work to expand that to include other coastal cities across the Western Cape. So we have a very, very deliberate focus um, also on ensuring that we um, attract investment and that we work in the export and tourism space 
that it affects all of the districts. It's a very deliberate um, a, a strategy to try and achieve that. And what I will do through the chairperson, I will be more than happy to send the five slides that we have on how our numbers are disaggregated across the different districts. Um, with respect to the, uh, I just want to get to the back here. Yeah, so that is what we have. So we do have a deliberate focus. And in fact, if you look at our numbers coming through this year, then you will see that there's been a deliberate effort to also increase the investment leads in the district. So there's so, so there's so there's there's we active about that. So I think if it wasn't the case in the past, I certainly want to assure the committee um, that we're doing our very best. Having said that, obviously we can showcase all of the districts, but it is up to the investors at the end of the day to make their decision about where they can attract, um, you know, the, the the workforce that they need, where they can get to the facilities that they need. So if we look at investments, um, Cape Town, uh, 3.8 billion of that was Cape Town. Um, West Coast, uh, 52.6 million was West Coast, Cape Winelands, 289 million was Cape Wineland. So the the, the the giant share is still in Cape Town. So that's that's a work in progress. Um, on the trade side, Cape Winelands is 1.7 billion, all the wine. Uh, Garden Route is 8.7 million. Cape Overberg is 10.7 million and West Coast is 389 million. So there's quite a, you know, if you're looking at the, and next year you will see this in our annual report, I will certainly make sure that we also, that we also share some of that information. Um, with respect to the, so I'm working backwards, so the last questions, <laughs> I'm working through those first. Um, with respect to um, staffing and, um, and, uh, and, and the terminations and so on, um, we certainly had, um, uh, I think page 81 2. Let me just go there, please. Page 81 and 2. Yes, so we, we certainly did have, um, we had staff movement. Um, and different to previous times, our recruitment processes kind of kept a pace with the resignations. Um, a number of people are included in this, including the two people that, because of the qualified audit, we had to follow consequence management. The, we had to apply the um, consequence management framework. Um, we applied it, and two people were were dismissed um, uh, as a result of that. Um, and uh, resignations. I think the you know when you have I suppose a new leadership team coming in, you, there, there will be changes um, in 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 the staff complement. Um, and uh, I'm I'm very comfortable to say that we have a full executive team in place. Um, we have a full senior management team in place. We have a full management team in place. In fact, um, uh, I think that the you know that the, the the team are much more. Um, in fact, we've only had uh, five resignations up until now, so probably uh, looking to achieving a much better a much better performance. So Westgrow, because our staff are very very exposed to the private sector, our staff do get poached by the private sector. Um, our salaries are unfortunately. Our salaries are comparable with a small, a medium-sized NGO, um, and it's very, very difficult to, uh, you know, to 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 ensure that staff, you know, it's it's been much easier, but it is difficult to ensure that staff stay. The environment was difficult last year because we had to completely open up every bonnet, look under every stone. We had to really overhaul every single process. It was a difficult time. Um, but uh, I am confident that we should see um, a slowing down of that. Um, we have seven interns. In fact, as we speak, we have 11. Um, the interns are all young people, young graduates, um, women, uh, uh, the, the broad category of black, but predominantly African. Um, and they are integrating seamlessly into the Westcrow organization. Uh, to date, we have recruited four, 
four of the interns have been recruited and absorbed into um, into the agency. Um, and I'm very confident that, in fact, this is a really great initiative to support um, the Westcrow team as we go forward. Um, and with the, you know, with so it's something that we definitely are intending to um, continue doing. It's working incredibly well, um, and it means also that, uh, you know, over time we are able to absorb them um, into into the agency. Um, with respect to uh, film, I'm going to do the film one first. There was a there was a a question on the film industry. And what FTE, uh, FTE jobs uh, meant that was from uh, member van der Westhuizen. But again, this is an opportunity for us to showcase the work that we've been doing in the film industry. We have two film specialists and one person, you know, supporting a broader team um, in the in the services uh, space. We've had in the film area 21 declarations. And a lot of the declarations are, again, in the districts. So Cape Town, Cape Winelands, Garden Route, Cape Overberg, West Coast, Central Karoo. The companies are from India, UK, Germany, France, Sweden. Yes, indeed. And these are companies that are coming into the Western Cape to film in the Western Cape. So they use Western Cape locations. They use Western Cape people to film right here in the Western Cape. And that is the reason that there is a predominance of uh, um, uh, foreign companies that are filming in the Western Cape. Um, we have, as you, in, yes, so we have also focused on taking, so we have taken eight companies to, I don't know how to pronounce it, my French is not good, Kane. Khan, okay. Khan, you see, Minister, yeah. I was going to be looking at you for the pronunciation there. What is it? Can can. <laughs> so we took we took um, South African companies to Can because I think there is an opportunity to invest and and grow South African companies. But I wanted to give you a sense of some of the names of the companies that have invest that have come here to to do productions. It's a thriving industry, and in fact, we work very closely with the city of Cape Town on this. They issue some of the permits, and they make sure that all of the, you know, where the roads need to be closed, or whatever. So there's a lot of work going on. So it's Netflix, Sea Monster, Trigger Fish, the Garden Root Film Company, Rise and Shine Films, Freeze Flame, Mo Mother Pictures, and I can go on and on. Moonlighting, Film Fixer. So there's a whole lot, and then some really interesting titles that are shot here. So VSD Mall, that is a Dutch soap opera, um, and it is filmed right here in the Western Cape. Um, we also have um, a, a title called One Piece, and that is an Afrikaans piece that is filmed right here in the Western Cape. Now, some of the titles here, they're not mine. They're that, that of the producers, The Kissing Booth, Homeland, Doctor Who, The Pirates Are Coming, Tomb Raider, Love Island. These are some of the titles that are being either fully or partially shot right here um, in the Western Cape. We also had the African launch of Bridgerton in Cape Town and a whole range of West Coast staff actually dressed up in the theme of Bridgerton and went to the function. Some of them sitting here, I won't point them out. Um, but we also had Queen Charlotte, um, who is the main character um, come to um, Stellenbosch um, this year. So what we do in the space is we work very actively with all of the, the 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 film studios. We work actively with all of the film producers. We support them with location promotion, um, any red tape issues they have, land usage rights, and very very importantly visas. So this is a really wonderful opportunity for the employment of young people. Um, so we really, really are able to give our young actors and our young people in the film industry um, opportunities. So it's definitely a growing industry, and I will ensure that we do some more, um, that we do fully reporting on the work that we're doing in the film industry. I think that was a, that was probably a bit of an oversight. Um, so, Member and Kondalu, you asked some, you asked a difficult question, um, and that related to. I just want to see if I've gotten numbers of the declarations. So we had all of the 
we had all of the companies, um, we had the, the companies go to New York. We took companies with us to New York and the wine, the wine companies that um, went to New York, um, I don't yet see, um, and I will perhaps get back to you on that, but I'm quite confident that there were declaration that there were there were um, orders um, and probably those orders will come through in this financial well well it look it'll, we will we will report on it I'm sure at, at some point um, I don't know if if anybody can yeah okay so that I'll come back to you on that um, with respect to I'm going to ask Jacintha if she can maybe just talk to the methodology that we use. So, but before she she comes on, I just wanted to indicate that we have. Um, so, Jacintha looks after assurance um, within the with across the agency, and her job is to make sure that every number that we report in this annual report is substantiated with the necessary documentation. Um, and so that is a committee that we've set up to provide assurance to the ex and the board. Um, but we obviously, we are looking at outputs, outcomes, and right now we are also looking at how we can expand that into impact reporting. There is still some work that needs to be done. But Jacinta, perhaps you want to just add, not in full, on, on how we do the, how we measure our success. So uh, the the methodology that we use to measure our success is primarily to indicate where we have provided support that then therefore becomes the out output and then the outcome. So just to just to provide an example of the work that we discussed much earlier today with regard to trade agreements. So companies that we take out on on missions, we support them through the Cape Trade Portal. We support them through various initiatives. Sometimes it's even quite long um, lifetime that we do spend with them through export to development programs, et cetera. So over time, that becomes a trade agreement. And, and sometimes the trade agreements are quite rapid. Um, after we've taken them to market, other times it takes a little bit longer, different kind of market, et cetera. So we see the successes start to bear fruit when we have a trade uh, a trade declaration or a trade agreement is therefore signed. And the companies, because we've assisted them, they elect to give us this information, which we then use to, to quantify our numbers. We scrutinize that quite quite a bit. We ask the, the teams very uncomfortable questions. Was it this? Was it that? Are you sure? What happened exactly? And then we, we make sure that that information. So as a result, we track the number of trade agreements signed. And in some cases, you would see, for example, some companies had multiple trade agreements in different countries. And those are as a result of the different initiatives that we undertake. We also then therefore try to determine what is the rand value of those agreements that they have undertaken with a specific importer? And then therefore, what is their estimate with regard to the number of jobs that are created as a result of that deal? So we want to really be able to establish the work that we do and how that results in, in deals and then how that effectively translates into a rand value in a job. And sometimes the guys are quite honest and they say that this is keeping my business going and this is part of my growth and I don't necessarily have any additional jobs to declare as a result of this. So we try to have a success model that drives it all the way from our different initiatives into the actual outcomes that are focused on the companies and the jobs that they're trying to, to create. And then ultimately, we're going to be focusing quite significantly on a methodology to help us to determine that impact. That's very much in, if I have to take another example, focusing on the investments. Right now, in terms of the investments, what we see are direct jobs created as a result of investment. And those are jobs on payroll. And that's fantastic. But those breadwinners also support a community. So we want to now, going forward, be able to now do further calculations so we can establish, but how does that then reach much deeper across the, 
the economy because we understand that those numbers are also incredibly important to the people in this room as well as the public. Thank you. Thank you, Jacintha. Just maybe on the on some of the questions relating to the staff, there was also a question around supply chain finance and HR. Um, we did a, I, I prefer to call it a complete refresh of the finance team. Um, and you will see on my right that I appointed a new CFO. Um, we also brought in, so what we, what, you know, when I lifted the bonnet, what I found was that apart from the CFO, there were no qualified CAs in West Grove. Um, I then, uh, you know, obviously expanded the, the, uh, finance team so that we could cover all of the, the four, the four areas, um, uh, after Sandil, uh, Sandiso came in. Um, we appointed in the supply chain team, we appointed a chartered accountant in the, you know, across the agency where we needed chartered accountants, we appointed them, they're all in place. And because of them, they pulled us through the last bits of the last bits of the of, of the audit last year. Um, so they saw everything that uh, needed to be fixed and they were part of the process of fixing it. Um, the, the, the supply chain team in particular has been completely refreshed. Um, and uh, I'm comfortable that we are on a path to professionalize, um, you know, the support, the, the enabling functions um, across across the agency. Um, I'm now going to go to the question on, there were some really lovely questions here today. We're getting into the meat of what we do, not all the... <laughs> all the, um, the I want to now move into the boat building um, into the boat building um, space. So um, there's actually quite a lot of work that's happening um, in the Western Cape. So the Western Cape is the production hub of the South African boat building industry and accounts for almost 70% of marine manufacturing um, capability. 70% of the of the, the the yachts and the and the and the vessels that are built here are exported to the US actually. Um, so there's quite a big, um, you know, export uh, market to the U.S. We've got about 70 companies that operate in the man marine manufacturing sector. The majority of these are micro and small owner managers managed. Um, uh, almost uh, almost 80% uh, of leisure boats and 40% of commercial boats are produced for export. Um, and South Africa is a major global producer of catamarans ranking second to France. And in fact, recently we took a delegation to La Rochelle. I got that right, um, in France. Um, and uh, I can't say that we've, so taking a delegation doesn't always translate into a, into a declaration. You know, sometimes you have to go two, three years in a row before you actually get a declaration. But I just wanted to indicate to, to member van der Westhuizen that we are still working in this area. We still, we're still um, uh, quite active uh, in the boat building space. Um, right, Lara Shaw, and then the next one is vaccine manufacturing. Right, so on the vaccine manufacturing, um, uh, what was it? it was Nant SA? I think you're referring to Nant SA came was a US investor. And then there was obviously Biovac. Um, Biovac is doing very, very well. Um, they've attracted European funding from the European Investment Bank. Um, they are doing a lot of work to expand their um, cooling, their, co their cold storage system. Um, so I think, I think, I think you know, work is going very well. We've also done quite a bit of work with uh, with Pfizer and BioNTech. Um, so work is carrying on. Um, in those areas, and I think what I will definitely also do next time is maybe just have just have a focus. I will confess that um, within Westgro, we kind of got you know sometimes some of the areas are one person shows, um, and in the health space we did have uh, one of our staff members uh, on maternity leave, so you know then the work slows a little bit in that space, um, but that is the nature of. Uh, unfortunately, the work um, that 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 we do. Um, have I missed anything, Minister? Oh, the, the 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 bids, the bids and the events. Yeah. So, I think in the in the um, 
in the tourism space, uh, you know, apart from um, so the role of West Cross so on the continuum of this, I always like to see tourism as a continuum. Wiscro plays what we call in the consideration space. So we try and get international tourists to consider and other, you know, and, and South, South Africans to consider coming to visit the Western Cape. Um, so we have um, we have some big campaigns currently that are underway in the US and the UK. Um, we also have a local campaign that is um, kicking off at the end of this month. We'll be trying to get um, uh, other South Africans to come to the Western Cape. So those campaigns are happening, but we are in the consideration space. Once the tourist actually arrives in the Western Cape, then Cape Town Tourism and the other, the RTOs and LTOs um, take over from there. Um, but of course, we still keep a, we also work in the space of attracting the airlines to uh, fly directly to the Western Cape. Um, and we, in the last year, we've added seven new airlines in seven new um, cities. Um, and we're very, we're very proud, obviously, of 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 that achievement. Um, and we also, uh, I think, you're aware that we have a, a cruise Cape Town, where we bring the cruise ships uh, to the Western Cape. We had quite a good season. The season should be opening up, Monica, in uh, November. We, hmm? second of November. second of November, where we've got the Vasco da Gama. Uh, arriving at the cruise terminal and we'll be kicking off the the, the cruise season um, and uh, and we're very very excited um, that there's quite a lot of work happening um, in the you know in the in in the tourism space um, we've also done quite a bit of work in there's been a lot of um, work in the across the districts um, to support the districts with how they uh, market the value proposition. Um, and I think that that has also has also um, uh, gone really really well. Apart from the apart from the uh, leisure tourism, we also have what we call um, a business tourism. And with business tourism, we try and attract um, international um, conferences uh, to the Western Cape. And I just got a message this morning that we have just successfully uh, won the bid for bringing, was it the doctors? Family doctors. Hmm? Family doctors. Yeah, the family doctor conference, uh, family doctors award, uh, to the to the Western Cape. It's a world conference for family doctors. 3,000 um, passengers or packs. Uh, and uh, and we were up against Taiwan, Hong Kong and Dubai. And we're bringing it home to, to the Western Cape. Um, so we also do a lot of work to bring um, a, 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 um, business tourism uh, into the Western Cape, and we've had a very um, good good performance. I'm also happy to. I'm not sure if we've got it in the annual report. Do we have it in the annual report? The bids that we secured. Yes. Yes. Um, can we just refer the members to that page? Mm. We have it. I don't recall. Um, we just it would be. Oh. Mm. No, I don't think we've got the bids. Um, because a lot of those bids are confidential until the until the you know the the the, the organisers are happy for us to release it. But we certainly do have. Um, uh, I do have in the spec. So I can see if you can find it for me while I ask. Um. Well, I ask uh, Jacinta just to talk to the definition of FTE. So for purposes of uh, film and media promotion, we utilize a standard for the measurement of full-time equivalent jobs. So that standard has also been pulled through into the way that the DTIC does it, as well as the National Film and Video Foundation. So that calculation works on a rate of an average of seven and a half hours a day, five days a week, 52 days a year for a crew member. Um, so we receive the number of crew hours from the company that's making that declaration. And then we calculate that against 1,950 to be able to determine then therefore the full-time 
uh, equivalent. So that is, in other words, a full-time job. I do need to also just indicate that crew is crew quite wide. It's a very wide utilization of the term. So it's crew, makeup artists, hair artists, actors, it's it's all over the spectrum. So it's it's quite a quite a wide reaching effect when you think about what a full time equivalent actually means in in the job creation space and and what that means for for income. Okay. Um. Then the thank you, thank you, Jacintha, for just on business events. Going back to that, I have the list in front of me here. But of we submitted 51 bids, and you will see that we're incredibly active. We managed to secure 29 bids. So, um, so I'd say that is, yeah, that is. I, I can't do the sums right now, um, but but I would say that's quite a good performance, um, considering that we're up across, we're up against other international. Um, entities just with respect to what we do to rope in local businesses um Wescrow has um uh, together with partners launched the cape trade portal um and the cape trade portal um basically hosts local exporters any com any company in the western cape that wants to export is listed on the Cape Trade portal. And if there are businesses you would like us to work with, we would be happy to consider those. Um, that we now have over 5,000 products and services listed on the Cape Trade portal um, and over 250 exporters. And the intention is to keep growing that. Uh, so there's a lot of um, effort that goes into maintaining the Cape Trade portal. But in addition, what we do for exporters, we market the Cape Trade ex the, the Cape Trade portal under the banner of Made in the Cape. And in fact, we've brought you all little protein, the, the Made in the Cape, uh, yes. We've brought you all um, little pins, which we hope you will wear as often as possible. But it really is something. It's a it's 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 a brand that we're hoping to associate with products made in the Cape, um, and we put a lot of marketing behind that so that exporters can benefit um, from uh, from that. Yeah. In addition to the exporters, we have a big focus on getting buyers onto the Cape Trade portal. Um, at the moment, we've got 250 buyers, and these are global buyers that are registered on the Cape Trade portal at the moment. Um, and uh, there's a big effort to try and grow the number of exporters and the number of buyers. Uh, Minister, I will leave it there through you, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, sadly, we have gone significantly over our time that we allocated to Wesco. And so members, I would like to respectfully ask if we can um, close this round, if there are any further questions that you have, if we can submit them in writing to the department. Is that in order? I see two nods. Member Van der Stazen. Just on a lighter note, I was concerned about the pronunciation of the French town can, can all I say is the French could not, and I'll, I won't say that in the present tense. Thank you very much, member. All right, so um, with that, I also just want to check if there are any um, questions or comments from members of the public who might be in the house or online. All right. I see none. So with that, um, I would like to sincerely thank the um, the entity, Wesco, uh, for your hard work. Congratulate you yet again, um, particularly the leadership, the female leadership, um, who are doing a sterling job. And we look forward to seeing you grow from strength to strength. Um, with that, thank you. Um, you can be excused. Please help yourselves to any refreshments. And then we'll move on to our next entity. Um, so if you if you'd like to Make your way so long. Um, and then in the meantime, if Saldana Bay can start preparing um, for their questions.
Uh, so members and to the officials, we will now be looking at the or considering the 2022-23 annual report for Freeport Soldana IDZ. With that, um, I'll hand to the minister to start with an overview and then to CEO, should CEO wish to make some remarks. Thanks very much, Chair. In the interest of time, I'll be very brief. Uh, we are very happy to present the Freeport Saldana's uh, annual report. You'll also notice the change in the name from the Saldana Bay IDZ to Freeport Saldana as a result of the uh, Freeport status of the entity, which is an exciting development, which uh, we can share more information about, uh, as well as um, the entity's good audit outcomes. And uh, we look forward to answering any of your questions. Uh, perhaps uh, the uh, what then, Chair of the Board or the CEO would like to make some opening remarks? Uh, th thank you, Minister, and good day to all the honourable members. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, now, I just would like to thank you, uh, thank the um, Western Cape Parliament uh, for assisting us in, in Saldana Bay with the Freeport. This has been a difficult year for, for the Freeport of Saldana. Um, we have aligned ourselves and um, our corporate plan, we've aligned that to, to be streamlined with green hydrogen. Uh, we have realized that Soldana can play a massive role in the, green, in the green hydrogen corridor and in the green hydrogen plan. And uh, in in this financial year, um, or the financial year that we were, that, 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 that's, that's under discussion here, our focus and the board's focus was on the conversion of our investor pipeline. This was seriously hampered by our relationship or the lease agreement that we had with TNPA. And we focused a lot on trying to solve that and finding a way to get by uh, and work together. And uh, the CEO has already alluded to the progress that we have made. Um, we had a high focus on the relationship building and so forth with TNPA. Another focus that the board uh, sort of um, highlighted was the shortened sustainability target that we, uh, uh, that, we that we had to adhere to. And um, the CFO, CEO has already spoken about the EO, EOI that we've um, that we have uh, um, uh, and, and endeavoured on. So at this stage, our opportunities is focused on our North Precinct, and uh, we have got high hopes that we will grow this uh, um, industrial zone into a in, into a rather large uh, inv um, investment opportunity place for uh, for for the Western Cape. So with that with that few words, give over to Sof. To Chair, I have no comments and I'm open to questions. Excellent, thank you and welcome again. With that, um, we'll jump straight into questions. I see Member Van de Vesthuizen first. Thank you, Chair. And, and thank you for this beautiful report that you've presented to us. My question is, uh, when we visited you some time ago, and also in your report, it's reflected that the Saldana Bay Harbour is in need of further investment uh, and expansion and that opportunities are there for that. Now, I do know that uh, Minister Wenger as well has been has been engaging particularly on the port of Cape Town. I don't know to what extent the port of Saldana has been on the, on, on the chart, but one of the options, because we know that government is cash strapped at this point in time, uh, and and one of the options uh, mentioned was that we should get the private sector involved because there is some money to be made from a well operating harbour or port. And the question for me is to what extent do you foresee that or have you engaged with the possibilities of also attracting private sector investment for the upgrading of the Saldana Bay harbour? Is there is there uh, uh, any thoughts of that? Have you tested that, for example, with with Portnet and its 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 uh, parent company Transnet, uh, to 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 achieve eventually what we all want to see, and that is that the, that that there's a bigger movement of 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 goods uh, through through uh, the port, uh, and to what extent would that you see your role in perhaps facilitating? such investment in, uh, in, 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 in the area that you're operating in. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Member. Members, any further questions? I uh, saw so Member Mvambi first and then Member Nkondla. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Mine is really just a, a one question, really, and it's just more to do with uh, remarks as in the overview of the CEO. 
Uh, you know, whenever you see deficit, you always, uh, it always in accounting terms, will raise eyebrows. Is that a once-off, or is that going to be a continuing trend? And then, is it avoidable moving forward? Is that not going to be a recurring uh, occurrence? Of course, still on the overview of the CEO, I see there you have transfer the additional and asset transfer worth 8.4 million to the Saldana. I would I would thought that it's us who are supposed to be getting land, not the other way around, transferring it to them. You know, because if we are trying to to build ourselves from scratch, what was the what was that transfer about? You know. Uh, uh, just like if you can actually shed more light on that. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, good. Uh, is it still morning? Oh, yeah. Uh, good morning once again, colleagues. Um, I just want to understand uh, on page nine, uh, Chair, you do mention that um, the commitment of the board to the shareholder to be self-sustainable by 2019 as projected is seemingly a challenge. Um, unattainable, as you say, uh, because of the reasons placed there. So what I'm interested now to understand is that what has been the renegotiation between you and the shareholder about still achieving that, given the hit and miss um, of the related circumstances that would have led you not to be able to realize this very important um, a commitment that you would have done, uh, considering that uh, the issue of self-sustainability self of state-owned entities is a national outcry. Um, and I think it's, it, 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 it borders on the fiscus that is highly constrained, whether in any way, as we know now, we are all crossing fingers of what the, um, the, the announcement of the national minister of, of, of finance will, is going to say to all of us. So it may seem that uh, this particular goalpost is going to even move further. What are other innovation and conversation with the shareholder about how you seek to be self-sustainable, if it is possible in any way, and if so, by when? So I'm interested uh, indeed in that in that in that conversation, understanding actually the complexity that is surrounding uh, where you are located as an entity, having to deal with local government, provincial government, national government, national entities, it's not an easy space. Um, I'm, 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 I'm sure you may need to talk to those who are in polygamous relationships. Maybe they may have some ideas on how you manage uh, too many uh, wives um, or husbands in a polyandry uh, a re a relationship. And then my 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 second one, um, uh, 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 Chair, is that I think on this AMSA and Sasol opportunity, which I think is a a great um, great news actually, considering that on one hand, you know, we were sitting I think in the last administration uh, fighting about the issue of the temporary closure of the operations of uh, Asselo Mittal. Because Asselo Metal shared jobs there, and we know in Saldana, I mean, Asselo Metal was the biggest employer. So I, I'm not sure whether directly this uh, hydrogen project may bring back those particular jobs. That I do not know. But how is this uh, a, a project at this point? If you can just give us 
some information. Where is it at this point? Is it still at conception? When is it gonna come to come to stream? What are some of the some of the challenges? And I think on the skill side, appreciating what has been done, um, I don't see Mr. Lakaban today. I'm not sure who's standing in for him, um, but I saw that uh, there was a a hub there that you you, which I think is another a great thing that you did, uh, which will focus on skills. But I'm not sure to the extent of the pipeline from high schools there, you know, in terms of uh, that hydrogen hub uh, uh, training that is there, uh, because it's one thing to have the hub, but if we're going to get traction of the right people, um, I would have been interested in that. So I would want to just uh, uh, stand there, uh, Chair, on my questions for, 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 for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, member. Members, any further questions? Okay, I see none. Um, I was also just curious from my side about green hydrogen. Um, and first of all, I wanted to understand um, what sort of green hydrogen are we looking at here? Uh, whether there's been any research about pros and cons of different types. Um, I'm also interested in, I, I understand the department is playing quite an important role in terms of combating load shedding. And to my mind, this isn't necessarily something that will work to allay um, load shedding or energy constraints, um, but more for private consumption vehicles, that sort of thing. Um, I just wanted to understand where that demand is coming from. And then I'm, I'm curious as well on who the demanders are. Um, is this private sector like Total or Shell, um, or is it uh, other countries, Germany? Um, if you could elaborate on that as well, please. And then uh, lastly, when are we expecting this to kick off? Um, Really excited uh, for it to happen. I think it, it'll definitely bring us into the modern age or into a, a new age, let's put it like that. And um, I, I wanna congratulate you on the efforts. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair, thank you, members. Um, so um, to the first question on the on the port needing investment and expansion and um, what what is our role in facilitating this and the processes underway there. Um, so we certainly see our if we can think of the free port will be where manufacturers and services companies are located and their customers would be the agents, the shipping agents, the uh, um, vessel owners of vessels that come into the port. So they can offer their goods and services to people that come into the port. Um, and in that way, then we are the essentially the aggregator of the of the demand uh, for port infrastructure. Um, over the over the year under review, uh, I think it has been important, but in the previous we, year, we had done a pre-feasibility study, you know, taking stock of the commitments made in Operation Pakisa um, and what was responsibilities of TNPA at that time, because they were very much influential then to what happens on the land side and that turnover of investment pipeline to operating businesses. Um, and uh, under the year, we also, Provincial Treasury issued a, uh, created a facility for project preparation, specifically for catalytic infrastructure projects. And so we applied to that fund um, to then take the pre-feasibility study to feasibility study stage. And throughout that process, we worked uh, hand in hand with TNPA because, as I said before, we need to make sure that what role we take and the actions that we uh, um, uh, do are in alignment and don't interfere with the Ports Act, right? Um, so uh, we were successful in that project preparation facility out outcome, and uh, we're looking forward to the allocation thereof and then working uh, with DNPA on the feasibility study for new port infrastructure. And I want to say it's a partnership model then, because what we are providing through the uh, through through the um, the earmarked allocation is a contribution that TNPA can also match, um, and they are committed to that port infrastructure. Over the um, outside of the year under review, they have recently updated their port development framework plan, uh, which went through extensive public consultation processes. And if you see that port development framework plan, 
the marine infrastructure that I'm speaking of is tabled in that plan. Um, now, TNPA and Transnet have very long, more complicated routes of raising capital than, than us. They're a national state-owned company. So um, their process is that they would have to register the business case with the port regulator and with Transnet Group. And recently, uh, TNPA uh, in Saldana confirmed that they have registered the project with the port's regulator as a capital project. So that enables them to allocate capital to the project so that they can also, hand in hand with us, put their investment into the feasibility studies. And the ultimate aim of doing these feasibility studies is to create a bankable project that can go out to the private sector. Um, for, and uh, I can use the example of the bids that have been happening in Durban and also the terminal um, uh, in, in the Riches Bay as well. So if you have that in mind, the ultimate goal of these processes, that is what we are doing together with TNPA. It is uh, a long process um, and and overdue, but we remain committed and uh, um, TNPA is very much also committed from what I have seen and from what my team has engaged with on uh, um, increasing that public sector participation and making sure that there is real investment happening in the in the port after so long. Um, I think... Uh, Yeah. And I mean, uh, when we were doing our pre-feasibility study, sorry, um, my CEO just reminded me, the indicative value of that investment is 3.2 billion rand. Um, and so together with the NPA, we need to refresh that data, refresh the market demand that has changed over the last year uh, so that we can have a bankable financial, uh, fi financeable uh, um, uh, project. Um, in terms of the deficit being, uh, uh, and the question of, yeah, it, it, um, these have been quite a challenging year, and I think also the knock-on effect of the last two years before that. Um, and uh, we are quite committed to going back up into the positive, but we are also very much dependent on the private sector actually coming in, start paying rentals. Uh, um, their projects, you know, uh, serving their customers, employing people. So it is a knock-on effect of that, um, uh, you know, lowered confidence in our economy that 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 we spoke of um, um, previously, that was spoken of previously. Um, so we are in discussions with the with 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 the shareholder, and I think to to kind of segue into the question um, that was posed to the to the chair. Um, of um, you know the uh, what are we doing and 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 the renegotiation. So those renegotiations are underway. The shareholder has asked us for a full comprehensive business plan, cost containment strategy of what we've done and what we intend to do going forward. Um, we are also, and I want to, uh, my chair is also the MM of the Saldana Bay Municipality, and you will see also in his forward that in terms of those innovative. Uh, um, solutions of sharing the the risk and the responsibility um, of this SOE. Uh, we are uh, courting Saldana Bay to perhaps take shareholding as City of Cape Town did in uh, Atlantis and as Tuane did in Tuane Automotive SEZ. So there is precedent for this, um, as well as possibly the private sector. So. Um, there are DFIs um, uh, who see value, who have a shared mandate for socioeconomic infrastructure and, and catalytic investment. So that might be um, alternatives, but these will take time. Uh, there's no denying that. We are not um, looking at it through rose-tinted glasses. It is a very challenging environment. Uh, we have done uh, cost containment, um, and uh, we will continue to apply our minds to that um, and looking for avenues of supplementing um, our costs uh, and, and the strategic initiatives that we still need to do. Um, because as much as we need to balance the now, we also need to make the choices uh, for the future as, as well. Um, 
In terms of the asset transfer to the municipality, uh, this came from um, an, an agreement that we had made some years back, actually, when we started. So uh, when the SEZ uh, was established, we needed to do uh, various bulk infrastructure improvements on the municipal network to, to, to accommodate the utility needs of what the zone would be. Um, and there was a value assigned to that, and that, that funding was raised from the DTI, from the SEZ fund. So this asset transfer is actually the last bit of those assets and improvements that we needed to make. And because we don't want to be the operator of the um, pump station, and it's the municipal property, so the asset had to be transferred at the when when we were done with the construction. Um, uh, I think on 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 um, on Arcelor Metal and, and Cecil, um, it is really great news. And I want to say, and I think there's a couple of questions related to hydrogen in in in, in from 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 the committee. For us, we are quite clear on the practicalities. Uh, uh, of of this opportunity. Number one, we see hydrogen, green hydrogen, as a, f a molecule that needs to go in into into industrial processes to actually because and because it's zero carbon, it will actually help improve the the, the it will it will remove the carbon emissions uh, from that product. And if you're thinking of the co uh, carbon border adjustments, so any of our exports that come out. Uh, now will have to be taxed in accordance with that carbon border adjustments. And having using green hydrogen in these industrial processes of producing green cement, green fertilizer, uh, green steel, green fuels that go into ships, that go into cars, uh, trucks or trains or buses, you now have a lower, lower carbon footprint. So it actually we are contributing to making the Western Cape economy and the products it produces more resilient and more competitive on the global scale. Because when they reach those export markets there, they will now not have to, uh, you know, the price in the, uh, and pay for the taxes there. So when it comes to OcelorMetal and Sassel, the project is that Sassel would produce the green hydrogen and, and, and provide that to OcelorMetal so that the steel mill can restart and produce a product which they call direct induced reduced iron, which is the pellets. It's not 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 steel, um, and that's called green DRI now, and that would be for export markets or possibly local offtake. Um, it would bring the steel mill back to life. Uh, there is there is an investment that's required to retrofit the steel mill to be able to take in the hydrogen in their processes, and obviously also Sassel's investment, which uh, is is quite large. Um, as to where the project is, um, last week was last week, a week before last, um, at the Green Hydrogen Summit, uh, we actually facilitated a meeting uh, with with Sassel, with Arcelor and another one partner that they are pulling nearer, which is mainstream renewables power. Because the question is always, where's the green electrons going to come from? And mainstream renewable power is an IPP developer and operator already in South Africa. So they have some solar farms in South Africa and, and across the world. They're an international uh, um, uh, company. And um, so this partnership is, is actually an amazing opportunity that's been long in the making because now you have a company that's mainstream that is producing the green electron. You've got Sassel, which is a chemicals company that has is already producing grey hydrogen in the in the in the uh, facilities up north, and grey is uh, hydrogen based from uh, 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 gas um, or coal. Um, and now you have an off taker, so you have their customer right there. So uh, we facilitated a meeting with the department, uh, with the department, with the premier, the DG, um, with with um, and Matt and from Atlantis and Westgro was also involved to essentially for these three private sector role players to brief the Western Cape, uh, the, the the administration on their project and what it means. Uh, so where they are right now is they are in pre-feasibility study stage. They hope to finalize the pre-feasibility study shortly. Next year for them, they are aiming to undertake the feasibility study. The IDC has provided funding to uh, Oslo Metal to fund some of the feasibility study. So that that so you know it's 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 already a, a key financier lockdown. 
Um, and if you speak to Arsenal Metal, and I can share this because it's already been publicly, you know, they've, they've stated themselves, they want to uh, restart in 2027. And um, because them looking at the market that they can serve for green DRI, they're also in competition. Uh, so they see that it's technically possible to retrofit the mill. Um, and uh, um, they have now key technical partners in the in, in the in the venture. So their target date is 2027. There's a lot that needs to happen, and this is all contained in a document, which um, in an overarching document uh, that we've been working on with the department, with Westgro, um, with with Atlantis, called the Green Hydrogen Co Concept Note, which is internal in the province, to really outline the what green hydrogen needs uh, and, and, and the opportunities thereof. Um, yeah, yeah. So the, the important thing uh, is that this investment will not be in the current footprint of the SEZ because it is large. I mean, if you think of Sassel's Secunda plant in size, in scale, to, to, to copy that, uh, the Freeport doesn't have uh, enough land. So it would mean an expansion of the SEZ and we would look to support from the DTIC uh, in that application from SASL to be included in the SEZ because there's you know certain processes as, to, as per the SEZ Act that would need to um, occur. Um, I think on, on uh, uh, skills, um, the... A key partner uh, going from strength to strength is the chemical CETA. So it's with their partnership that we launched the opening of the Smart Skill Center in October last year. Um, and it's focused on, it's bringing really another benefit, another uh, um, bow in, in our quiver really to augment the artisan training that we've already been doing for quite some time and, and that the committee well knows of in Saldana. So this is focused on digital skills um uh and 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 open access uh technology um not open access technologies but open access for the people of Saldana because it's located in the main street in Saldana it's not far away in the IDZ it's 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 operated out of one of our buildings there and anyone youth uh it's particularly targeted at, at youth and unemployed youth um can access and go and do their training there um, we host the facility, the chemical CETA is providing the funding on a program basis and any third party, any service provider that wants to use the facility um, uh, can can do so uh, with agreement with the chemical CETA. So the one of a few of the past programs that we've just now been running is in partnership with Amazon Web Services, with Forge Academy. Um, really, it's it, it's it's. It's it's amazing to see the the work there, um, and uh, Chemical CETA has also done. And why and why this is a valuable partnership is that the Chemical CETA has been tasked by Minister uh, um, Zemande to actually study the hydrogen skills needs, and they have produced a report that says the hydrogen economy needs su such and such skill sets, right? Uh, and so now what they are doing is they are using that report as a basis of saying for the, for the CETA, these are the strategic targeted uh, programs then that we need to do. And as being a partner with them, a trusted partner that has a long track record of showing value to them, we our intention is to use that small skill center as the conduit then for saying, you know that you need to do these schools for the uh, skills for the hydrogen economy. You, can you uh, use the smart skill center to really access and give 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 Saldana an opportunity to meaningfully participate and 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 obtain skills development? Um, the high schools is particular then the next level down of that skills challenge. Um, over the last year, we have worked with the Department of Education to do programs in the high schools across Saldana, including Faltrift. We are currently still in discussions with the Department of Education um, to re-examine the program uh, going forward uh, because the Department of Education is obviously also doing various other initiatives in the area, the back on track and so forth. So we want to be complementary to what is uh, uh, happening in, 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 in the 
Department of Education's program, uh, but also mindful of the specific needs that we need for that targeted area of Saldar um, versus versus other areas. Um, I think, uh, Chair, on your on your question of the pros and cons. So, I mean, uh, green hydrogen is it's called green uh, uh, green because it comes from solar and wind and offshore wind, so renewable energy. You can have pink hydrogen, which comes from nuclear. Um, Grey, blue, what is the turquoise? I think is one one another color. Um, so uh, it really, I, I want to say that I, I I don't think that uh, I don't we we don't uh, are not aware of any pros and cons. It's really about um, the source of uh, the uh, the the um, the water and the energy that you use. So whether you're using you know a lot of, of What's your energy source in this in the electrolyzer okay. that defines the colors and so forth? So if so, for example, for France, they are pro pink hydrogen because they have a lot of nuclear uh, uh, plants, power plants historically. So for them, it doesn't really. It's a. It's also kind of a, why are you asking me to go into solar when my competence, my whole industry, my backbone of my economy is based on nuclear. I have these assets, right? So different countries are adopting different types of hydrogens based on their contexts. Um, in Saldana, we know they have good wind and solar opportunity. Um, and uh, what makes hydrogen is we have off takers, as I've said. So you have a market right there that you can serve. You have already an existing port as well. Some of the other projects still have to do port developments. So that's kind of really the high level pros and cons of why, why hydrogen. Um, I want to add on the, the previous question on the that uh, um, uh, um, member van der Vest has raised of hydrogen and load shedding. With these production plants of producing hydrogen, you want to make sure that the electrolyzer operates 24-7. It's 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 massive plant that you can't just switch on and switch off, you know, uh, if you don't have water, if you don't have renewables. So all of the project developers, and it's been studied quite extensively, that in order to operate a hydrogen plant, you need to oversize your your, uh, your renewables as your water, actually. And you probably also they need to have a storage solution, like a battery storage solution. So the project developers will actually be assisting in allaying load shedding and also water resilience and water insecurity because they need solar and wind two, three times of what they actually need in the plant. And so when they don't need that, uh, the storage, it can go back onto the grid. Um, and uh, similarly for, for water um, as well. So we don't, it, it can actually be very complementary and actually be a key unlocking from the private sector to address load shedding. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very much looking forward to seeing the future of this pan out. Um, members, so we have um, an, a, just over an hour um, for us to conclude the AACZ um, as well as to do our own resolutions. Would it be in order if we made that our final round um, and submit any further questions? OK, I see nods. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to, for the record, check if there are any members of the public online or in person who would like to raise any questions to Freeport. I see none. All right, with that, I want to sincerely thank um, Freeport. Congratulations on the work you're doing. Um, it's really exciting stuff. And thank you for bringing this to the Western Cape in particular, um, this innovation. Um, please help yourself to any coffees or teas in the background. And in the meantime, um, if uh, Atlantis, you'd like to move a bit closer to us, we won't bite. And um, we'll get started on your report shortly.
All right. Thank you, members, and thank you to the officials, minister and department who are still with us. Um, we are catching up on time, thankfully. Um, I would like to just begin by congratulating Atlantis on your recent um, AGM. I hear that was quite successful, um, and it's great to see the continuity. I will now hand over to the minister and CEO as well, um, should they wish to make any remarks, and then from their questions. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Chair, uh, to you and the committee. Uh, again, we're uh, very happy to present the annual report for the Atlanta Special Economic Zone for the 22-23 financial year. It's our youngest uh, ACZ uh, now uh, sort of has left the nest, as it were, and now fully, um, uh, you know, sort of flying on its own. And uh, we're very happy that they, uh, in spite of uh, being a new entity, managed to achieve a clean audit, which is uh, very commendable. Um, and then we're happy to answer any questions related to the performance indicators uh, for the entity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, would the Chair CEO like to make a comment as well? Thank you, Chair. Um, we are happy to move into the questions. I think we're very happy with um, what we were able to achieve in the financial year under review. So uh, we we're working in a in a slightly tough context economically, um, but we feel like we've made excellent progress. And as the minister rightly points out, we've made the transition into uh, implementation now, and uh, we're well underway with getting our first uh, zone ready uh, to start building factories. So exciting times and very positive uh, from our perspective. Thank you. Thank you. That is indeed exciting. And congratulations on the audit outcome as well. Members, I put it to you now. Do you have any questions? I recognize firstly Member Van der Then I think I saw Member Seleko and Member, Member Seleko. Was that a hand or not? Yes. It was. Okay. And then Member Nkonsla. Good. Thank you, Chair. Chair, uh, I want to raise three items from the uh, annual report. The first one is in terms of uh, the uh, land that you are now developing. My understanding is you're putting in civil services, but you also want to continue and put up top structures. Now, what we do know is that, you know, normally you first get a commitment from somebody that, they, you know, they would say, we're not into property, we're into manufacturing, so you build the factory and we will do the manufacturing, you know, that, that kind of uh, horses for courses uh, situation. But in your case, it seems to me you do not have uh, uh, tenants signed up for those top structures. So my first question is, you know, how do you design a top structure? Because not all st top structures are generic. Some would require a stronger foundations, for example, if, if you want to install heavy manufacturing equipment. Others might be more office intensive, uh, administratively, uh, uh, you know, requiring more offices and so on. And, and there's a big difference between an office and, and a factory floor. So if you could just help us. The second one is, so so uh, what amounts are we lo looking at in terms of uh, that you intend to spend on on the civil services as well as the, the top structures? Then uh, the one thing which which worries me is my impression was always that these SEZs would have a special dispensation from National Treasury, which would uh, assist SEZs to be able to attract new business to those those areas. And if we if we look at so many of these, and and uh, it's been my privilege to to have visited Kuga. Uh, a number of years ago, and again last year, I, I, I just popped in there. Uh, uh, they're struggling to really attract investors uh, because my that's my impression. Those tax incentives or other incentives, financial incentives, have not really been developed, uh, or either they're not attractive enough. So perhaps, and I do see you referring to that also, it seems to me as, as one of your frustrations. What is the latest in, in that regard? And then uh, the last one, that she, uh, under the former CEO, Fuchs, he also raised the whole issue of the revival of the railway line between Atlantis and, uh, and, and the city of Cape Town. 
Now, uh, for me, uh, you know, we can't even get our railway lines, which used to transport tens of thousands of people every morning to work and back. We can't even get that up and running. Uh, so what makes you believe that a railway line between Atlantis and, and Cape Town uh, would be a viable uh, uh, issue to pursue? Uh, do you really believe that they, because that's going to be for goods, that's my impression, it's not going to be for, for pass, a passenger, it's not a PRASA initiative, but you know, how many goods do you require to make a railway line viable? And especially if I think of all the trucks that run up the N7 up past Bitterfontein. Bitterfontein has got the most beautiful infrastructure from a railway point of view, but it's completely un, 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 unused. So what do you, what, what, why do you believe that you can succeed with so many other railway lines uh, don't? Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. I see Member Seleko. Sure, thank you very much. Just me or a few ones. On page 41, you're talking about systemic challenges. I just need to get more information how we are dealing with the systemic challenges that we have mentioned. And also, Chair, in terms of page 71 and 72, I see there's a number of resignation. Uh, could it be because people are, are getting better pay somewhere else? I uh, just want to know some of the reasons why people uh, seem to be leaving. I think there's about eight. And also an issue of written warnings. There's about four. I can just give an info. I don't want names just as to what uh, is the uh, problem with discipline or, or what or what's happening just on, uh, on the surface. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I recognize Ben Van Gondlo. Thank you, Chair. On page 35, um, I'm trying to understand, um, there you mentioned that um, uh, Risolax, if I'm pronouncing it well, disinvested due to uncertainty in the procurement of that uh, renewable procurement program. Um, and you would further say um, the SEZ purchased the facility with Resolux, was was housed in and was able to secure a tenant in the facility during the negotiations of the facility price. If you can explain that. But secondly, just to explain to me um, this kind of an occurrence um, of the type of uh, investors um, that you deal with, and I'm not sure whether it's your target uh, sort of uh, investors that are um, linked to this um, renewables procurement program of government and what risk then it is, as you indicate there, that due to the uncertainty, because my understanding is that those projects, I mean, there's been a lot of uncertainty on the different bid windows as it relates to those. And I mean, it's not things that are within your control. Um, so how do you navigate that particular space? If you can, if you can just uh, uh, give me some some type of insight uh, uh, around 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 that. But also on uh, page um, page eight. I think you mentioned there that uh, whilst the SEZ is fully compliant, um, the SEZ-related tax incentives have not been promulgated. Um, redu reduce it into a simple layman's terms. What does it mean? What is happening there? And um, how is this particular problem being um uh, being uh, being being solved, and my last one on this round is that in terms of tenanting of your space, what percentage have you managed to tenant at this at this point, and do you have as part of your social responsibility any locals, uh, businesses that you know you have uh, offered space uh, in the in the in the in the SZ? Thank you, Chief. Thank you very much, members. Any further questions? I see none. I would just like to put one question of mine forward. Um, so on page 40, 
hope I'm on the right section here. I don't know, this is part, okay. Page 44, um, subprogram 1.5, ICT management. Um, it says here that it's, um, the ICT services are undergoing development still, that ICT support was provided by Wesco, but was terminated in February 2023, and an outsourced appointment um, or service provider uh, was appointed, and this was the um, ASEZ Co um, with ICT technical support services including XYZ. Um, I just wanted to understand why the change in the service provider, um, what wasn't being provided before, how did you need to expand or maybe scale down, um, and what made this a, a better opportunity? Thank you. I'll now hand back to the department and to Entity. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to say, um, Member and Condor, that although uh, I'm a male in this chair position. Uh, there's good representation of females in the organization from our shareholder to our board chair and to, to our organization as a whole. So we are in very good hands and I'm going to hand over a lot of the questions to, <laughs> to them to, to answer. So, but uh, yeah, so first of all, I think just to pick up on the question of land development and civils and top structures um, and that whole process of design. Um, typically in a property development, and this would happen if you, let's take Brol for example, and they've got a property development just next to Cape Town International Airport. Typically what they would do in a development like that is that they would go in and put in all the underlying civil infrastructure. So they would do the, the roads, um, the security guard house, the fencing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then they would market that um, development. And then as investors land, they would then design and build their facility in accordance with their specifications. And that's exactly what we are doing with the Atlantis SEZ. So um, we are currently busy servicing with civils our first zone, which is 22 hectares. Um, and then as investors land, um, we work with them to understand their needs in terms of their factory and their building and their space. And then we will design and build that factory according to their specifications. Um, generally, the amounts involved at the moment we have, um, and I'm going to just ask uh, Michael Pinar quickly to come in here and just tell us the amounts involved in the civils and the and the top structure work. Thank you, Matt. Um, good afternoon, Chair, um, honourable members. So for uh, the first zone, as Matt mentioned, 22 hectares, the civil construction project uh, amounts to 89 million, 83,368 rand, including the professional fees involved in that project. Uh, the construction work, the amount that we paying to the contractors, 80 million, 737,269 rand. So that's the contract value there. We are currently busy with an application for zone two and three. Um, and that amount uh, amounts to just under 400 million for the development of zone two and three. Now that application is still um, in process. For the first top structure, we have an approved amount, including professional fees of 13 million 864,795 Rand. We've applied for an additional 6 million Rand for elements in that structure that relate to um, sort of sustainable development, including rainwater harvesting tanks, making sure that more than 40% of the roof is indeed uh, covered in solar panels, etc. So that is the status at the moment of our civil uh, projects as well as our top structure plan for Zone 1. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. And then um, the the special dispensation around the tax incentives. And I think uh, both member and Contlo and um, member von der Westhuizen uh, have asked this question. Um, I it is it is a challenging one. We we are. Um, in the process and have written both to the DG of National Treasury to ask them to promulgate the tax incentives for the SEZ 
um, which is the standard procedure to do that. We have received no response at all from the DG of National Treasury, um, not even an acknowledgement. Um, we then subsequently wrote to the Minister of Finance, um, Minister Godongwana, and copied in the Minister of DTIC, um, Ibrahim Patel. Uh, we haven't received a response to that email either. What happened in 2020 was that Minister Mboweni, when he was Minister of Finance, said in his um, budget speech that Treasury would no longer be promulgating tax incentives for the SEZs. So all the all the IDZs, the initial uh, SEZs that were initially promulgated when it was still IDZ um, legislation, all received the dispensation for tax incentives. Um, none of the new SEZs, uh, so, so for example, Saldana Bay or Freeport Saldana does have that tax incentive dispensation, but none of the new SEZs do so ourselves, Twani, um, or any of the other new ones have had them promulgated. We've looked at the legislation, we've, re we've got a legal opinion which suggests that the Minister of Finance actually doesn't have discretion about whether or not to um, award them if someone requests that they be um, promulgated. So we've we've taken that legal opinion and that's what we wrote to the DG with that legal opinion and then also now to the Minister of, of Finance and also the DTIC. So our, our position is that um, really these incentives are uh, required. We currently have a playing field which is not level. Some SEZs have it and others don't. So, for example, if we're talking to an investor, they'll say, oh, but we've spoken to Kucha and they've got the incentives. And we say, well, look, we're trying. We will try and get them, but we can't offer them. Um, we we still have a very compelling proposition and we, we've packaged uh, an excellent set of, of um, uh, good um I would say not incentives, but a good package for investors, which includes very competitive rates on the land. But those rates on the land are also dependent on us receiving DTIC funding to build, to put in the civil infrastructure and to put up the top structures. And that's typically how it works. When Michael was referring to putting in applications for top structure funding, um, it was applications to the DTIC. So if we get the funding to build the factories, we can offer very competitive rates to the investors. However, the DTIC is also running out of money for the SEZ program. So whereas in the past the DTIC had the funds to, to allocate, it's becoming much harder for them to cater for all the SEZs and all the demands because their budget is not growing. So this is the challenge that the SEZ program as a whole is currently facing, and that faces us as well as the Atlantis SEZ. We've looked at ways to look at alternative financing and funding mechanisms, and I'm going a bit beyond the question now, but I think it, it, you, it gets to the heart of, of the kind of challenge that we find ourselves in. We are confident that we can uh, get the investment and that the investors are there. And I'm going to, uh, I will uh, ask Jared just to talk a bit more about that pipeline and the investors that we have and that we expect to land in zone one um, and beyond. Um, but at, at the end of the day, we are um, dependent at this stage for that grant funding to, to have a really good value proposition. I think there is, and going beyond, sorry, Chair, just but there, there is probably a need to relook at this SEZ program and the way that the incentive regime is structured. I think there are there are ways to improve it. There are ways to maybe make it slightly more <clears throat> tailored, so that each SEZ can focus on a speciality. We are targeting the renewables cluster and the agricultural processing cluster. So ideally, it would be nice to have a package that helps us target 
those investors and those industries. And at the moment, the program just has this one tax incentive across the board, which is not really nuanced in terms of the strategy. And if we're going to really work to build on the Western Cape's growth for jobs, it would be nice for us to be able to nuance our strategy and align it to the provincial uh, growth and development strategy. But that's just a, a thought at this stage. So um, coming back then to the to the question of the railway line um, from between Atlantis and, and Cape Town, um, you're absolutely right, uh, Member Van Verstezen, we, we do not see ourselves as being able to take advantage of that freight rail link in the current circumstances. Um, there is, uh, the, the, the railway line is not operational. We did a, a feasibility study to understand if the current tenants and investors in Atlantis would be interested in utilizing that freight rail link if it was opened. And the general sentiment at this stage, not surprisingly, is, well, we're not we don't really feel like we want to use Transnet as a service provider because we're not sure we can rely on them to deliver um, the goods. However, if that rail link was there, it would create all sorts of opportunities for us as an SEZ to become like a freight village and to help with some of the congestion that currently exists in the in the port of Cape Town and particularly with, with uh, goods coming down the West Coast, being able to offload there, put them into containers and then ship them straight into the port and, and from elsewhere. So it would unlock opportunities, but at the moment it, it's not promising uh, in the current circumstances. Um, if I could move on then to Member Seleko's question about the systemic challenges. Sorry, I haven't seen... Uh, on page 51 41 um, yes okay I think I think the first the first two uh, sorry the second two bullets there in terms of the SEZ fund and also the incentives uh, I think we've covered the first point about um, lack of funds for the capital program and reduced. Yes, so you know I think the the challenges around securing the funding and the support that we need in order to develop the zone um, and and some of the delays experienced around that can create a bit of. Um, fatigue, if you like, from, from stakeholders and investors. <clears throat> I hope the other two questions, uh, you're satisfied with, with the answers that, that we've previously covered uh, there. And then in terms of the resignations, I'm going to hand over to um, Ms. Saib, the CFO. Good afternoon. Um, yes, so it's a variety of reasons for the resignations. I think we can pinpoint it to a particular reason. I think about 40% of it had to do with um, some of their uh, previous employees having found better opportunities out there, better paying jobs, being in the green tech space. Um, it's it's actually people are sought in that space. So it wasn't something that we could compete with in terms of the salaries that they were offered. There were other movements in, in the resignations, but some of it was actually movements where people had um, short-term contracts that were actually converted then into longer-term contracts uh, when we had done the redesign of the organogram. So um, that's really the reasons for the movements. If you look at the disciplinary um, warnings, so we have a zero tolerance for non-compliance. Um, you may notice in the annual report that we had a small wobble. There was about 22,000 rand worth of irregular expenditure. So three of those four warnings were issued to the staff members that uh, were responsible for that. And we dealt with that matter. Okay, thank you. And then I'm going to hand over to Jared Lyons, Business Development Ex Executive, to deal with the question around Resilux, uh, the purchase of the building, and the challenges around the REAP uh, program. 
Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honourable Members. Um, <clears throat> perhaps I'll start with some of the untouched answers on some of the questions earlier. So, Member Van der Vestes, and just to be clear, we only build on specification on behalf of a landed tenant. So we don't build at risk the way you understood it before Matt, Matt explained. I just want to reiterate that. So we will only ever build a factory for a tenant that has a viable business case, um, which which undergoes due diligence. Um, on member and Kuntlo's questions around Resilux, Resilux is a, is a, a small international company um, of Danish origin that manufactures internals for wind turbine components. Wind turbines are destined for the large REAP program. The order, the order book on the REAP program was significantly constrained, in fact not constrained, comprised zero orders for a period of four years, which meant that they had a manufacturing facility that was manufacturing a good that had no destination to be sold to. They couldn't weather that storm because they were a smaller company, so they disinvested but they left the property behind, the actual asset, the building behind. That building was acquired by a company called IPROP, which is just a real estate company looking at trying to attract um, further manufacturers. We then noticed an opportunity in this because there is a significant demand, I will repeat, a very significant demand for pre-built top structures um, in Atlantis at present. In fact, we came from a meeting from Hisense yesterday requiring 30,000 square meters of space under roof in the next six months, um, which is which is a very encouraging sign for Atlantis. So we took the, the, the initiative to purchase that building from a VAT refund that we claimed from a purchase of the city's land through a shareholding. So we purchased city land to the value of about 56 million rand in the previous financial year, previous to the one under review. And we had a VAT savings on that. The building that Resilux was housed in was on the market for 14 million rand. We offered them eight because it's taxpayers' money. And they agreed that they would sell it to us at eight. We got permission from the minister and provincial treasury to enter into that purchase agreement. So we did. Um, we, we bought that building with a tenant already occupied in that building. Um, not yet a going concern by definition because their footprint wasn't large enough, but we're creating revenue for us, um, which meant that that building came onto our books at a zero cost, i.e. cost per month of operations. Okay, so they were covering the cost per month. That has now graduated from a very small tenant into a large tenant that has taken the entire space six months after taking ownership of that building. So illustrative of the demand of pre-built top structures in Atlantis. And that lease was signed, unfortunately, in this, well, fortunately, but unfortunately not in the year under review. Um, and that'll be our first significant revenue being generated by this company this year. Um, how do we mitigate against the so that addresses the question around Resolux disinvestment and us taking the, the the stance that we need to purchase the building. Around mitigation, around the renewables energy procurement program. So yes, a lot of our strategy, investment promotion strategy is centered around the old renewable energy independent power producer procurement program. We are all aware of, this, of the stumbling blocks and pitfalls in that program. But what's interesting, member and Kuntlu, is that just last quarter 12 billion rand dollars excuse me rands apologies 12 billion rands of of green technology components like inverters batteries and solar panels were imported into south africa so that's a signal that there is a huge demand for those kinds of products even though the reap is not healthy and the procurement process is is, is somewhat slowed down there's still a huge demand outside of that and in fact, um, honorable member, that seems to be the primary motivator for many of the manufacturing investments in this space at present is that private sector demand. So we, our strategy revolves around focusing both on the national government procurement program called the REAP, less so, and primarily on the, the, the high demand in private sector. So with the cap of 100 megawatts being lifted by, by President Ramaphosa, um, there is a significant interest by large mining houses, large chemical companies to procure their own power in the region of 100, 200, 300 megawatts. And that's the market that we're hoping to, to leverage to attract manufacturing investment from. Um, 
think there's one more. Yes. So as far as tenancy is concerned, what percentage? It must the, the members must be reminded that we have 94 hectares of of, of land. Um, 22 hectares of it is currently being serviced, so it's still largely greenfield, but we're putting the bulk infrastructure into that land. And on that land right now, we have one lease that has been signed. So of 11 plots, one of them is taken up. So I would say if you're looking for a percentage, honorable member, about 10% in that respect, but not forgetting that we also own this facility outside of that specific zone. Um, which is, if you're looking for a percentage there, and I'm going to be facetious, 100% because that facility is taken up by a single tenant. The question of local business is interesting, and I thank you for that question. The, the tenant that we've successfully landed in the fa factory that we bought from Resolux is an ex-Atlantis resident. So that, that individual went to school in Atlantis, born and raised in Atlantis, left Atlantis for a small period of time to go and seek out other opportunities and has now gone full circle and returned back to Atlantis. We had the lease signing ceremony on Tuesday this week um, and we're very grateful both to the SMME but also to the team for making sure that that deal has conspired in the way that it has. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and then, uh, Wahida, perhaps to you. Yes, thank you, Chair, for the question around the ICT management. So I think we were privileged during our incubation period where Wesco had supported us with their systems and processes and um, IT support as well. When we had been listed as a public entity and had managed to open our own bank account, that shared service with Wesco had actually come to an end, but uh, we had not been mature enough to actually uh, be able to take on the ICT infrastructure and our needs at that point in time. So it was kind of a, a phased out approach where Wesco was still supporting while we were trying to look for an outside service provider that could basically assist with our needs. Um, with also moving into Atlantis, so the operations in Atlantis also grew, so the infrastructure also had to meet the needs of the, of the growth in the entity. All right, thank you very much. Um, I see we are now at 20 past. Um, if we have to take another round, that would bring us to about 10 to 1 and would leave us for very short amounts of time for resolutions. So members, are we happy with that round and any further questions can be submitted? Okay, fantastic. I'm just going to quickly check and see uh, for the record if there are any members of the public in person or online who have any questions or comments. I see none. Yes, would you like Sorry, to Just to mention, we did have here earlier um, Mr. Saul Smith, who is a, a member of our community stakeholder network. <clears throat> we have an elected stakeholder network in Atlantis that represents different sectors in the community, and he is the representative for the small businesses. So he was here earlier and was uh, attending and participating, which for us is encouraging to see that we're uh, a key partner for us is, is here and, and engaged. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate you highlighting that. All right, with that, um, I want to thank the Minister, thank you HOD, thank you to all the entities who've joined us today. Um, I think we've we've made good time um, and caught up quite nicely um, and I hope you have a wonderful Friday. I hope you enjoy the rugby tomorrow and yes, well I'm not cheering Scopa but <laughs> Um, but I do hope you enjoy the rest of the day. All right. Thank you. And please help yourself to any of the coffees or refreshments at the back. Members, um, we'll just give it a minute and then we'll jump into resolutions.
just a reminder as well, we have food lunch. Um, I'm sure you are hungry. We've been sitting here for a while, so please help yourselves. All right, members, um, I think while the officials make their way out, we can just briefly touch on our resolutions. Um, can I get a hand or a raise of hands for any resolutions that have come forward from today? I recognize Member Van der Westhuizen, then Member Nkontlo. Thank you, Chair. Chair, um, as you would appreciate, unfortunately, the time was too limited to really ask all the questions that we that we wanted to ask. Uh, so my first uh, uh, resolution or proposed resolution is that we congratulate them on their annual reports and particularly then in the case of Westgrow that's been able to improve the, the, the audit outcome to an unqualified uh, audit report. Uh, in terms of the department's report, uh, although it seems to me quite often, you know, mm. it would appear in the department's report, but then it it's actually work done by Westgrow or one of the other entities. Um, th they indicated that they at one stage had a, a measurement called the percentage in tourist safety perce perce perception, tourist safety perception, which was uh, discontinued during the COVID. Sorry, remember, do you know the page? Uh, it's page 44. It was one of the previous uh, uh, KPIs indicators. Uh, they discontinued this during the COVID period, which one could understand, uh, but now they haven't reintroduced this. And I was wondering whether we could ask him whether they do still have this measurement. Is it still a study that's been undertaken? And if so, what have been the results of that, that, that study? Then secondly, um, <laughs> you know, we've had a wonderful rain here, a rain, uh, rainfall, uh, one of the previous indicators was also to enhance uh, what they call res resource resilience uh, in the economy, and that was by de uh, using water more effectively, assisting entities to save 20% on their water consumption. Now, on page 45, they changed this from a target of assisting, I think it was four entities, that they wanted to four water intensive sectors to, to one water intensive sector. Perhaps if we could just ask now, A, which sector are they now assisting? Uh, what have been the results thereof? And and why did they uh, you know decrease that that target of not assisting four? Because I think we all know that you know drought droughts will reoccur. That 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 we know. Those are the first two proposals from my side. Thank you, Member and Kontlo. Thank you, Chair. My first one, I think uh, we would need to find a way of how do we deal with um, the, our department and entities from a time point of view, because indeed the issue of time and um, us getting satisfactory answers becomes always an issue was becomes difficult to make follow ups uh, with time constraints uh, if we are for the same time on a department with three entities uh, the same way that we we'll do of a department with no entity or with one entity so i just want to raise that from a time point of view it will always give us challenges um so that we can be able to engage properly the the one issue i think in the department um one would be interested to just get more information from the skills unit. They spoke about the approach, uh, which I think Member Andukas was, was asking about, which they've moved from the previous one. I'm just interested in what they spoke about to get more information about that approach, which they have said that they've managed to one uh, out of the 85 million to leverage extra 200 million, if they can just give more information 
where did they leverage that money from? Who gave them what? And what are the conditions of those that funding? Secondly, as part of that, they even mentioned that the cost of their skills development program is even lesser than EPWP. If we, if they can also just explain that uh, that uh, cost comparison that they've been able to mention, because I think that's quite a great a development uh, to 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 understand uh, if if uh, if anything but also if we can just ask them to share with us the independent report or impact evaluation of the booster fund that would be done uh, through gtech as they as they had uh, uh, indicated uh, in their in their in their in their presentation and then on 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 west Grow, um, I would like, I think the CEO said she would send the information about the, what they call declarations, my pedestrian is orders um, uh, of the black wine labels that would have attended their trade exhibition so that we can be able to see that including the methodology that uh, they were speaking about because it was just too high level and I could not follow up just to understand the detail from the colleague who was uh, um, ex explaining. Um, I think those would be it from my side because the other questions I think, oh, and one, two, three pot, I that if they can give us an update uh, on the accelerometer or the hydrogen project as it uh, unfolds, uh, that would, I think, help us just to follow that uh, uh, development. I would then send my other questions I could not ask uh, in a written format. Thanks. Thank you, Member. I appreciate um, that you will send those other questions through. Um, I agree. We don't have nearly enough time to properly engage with all the entities and perhaps um, beyond noting, we can even make a proposal that um, whoever the future chair is, um, that they um, ask the chief whip or the programming um, committee that it be broken up over two settings because it's a lot to deal with in, in a few hours um, and a lot of information. Um, then just my own resolutions. Um, I agree with commending um, DDAT and particularly Wesco under the woman-led leadership of um, CEO Renal Stander and Minister Wenger. Um, I noted Member Seleku's uh, resolution or request earlier on the um, request for an invite um, with the event with our labs. Um, on Wesco, uh, I think it would be interesting to see um, how their investment um, promotion is disaggregated across um, the different municipalities. Um, they mentioned um, to Member Seleko that they would be willing to provide that information, but it wasn't necessarily possible to do it now. On Soldana Bay IDZ, um, I agree um, as well. I've made a note to ask when the um, green hydrogen note that's being prepared um, is completed if that could be sent to us. Um, and then on the Atlantis SEZ, um, I think uh, Member Fandavistes and Member Nkontlo, you both touched on quite an important issue of the tax incentives. Um, I do think it's concerning that they had written to um, Minister of Finance and DTIC and not received responses. And perhaps one thing we can ask is um, if they would be willing to share that correspondence with us so we can flag it with those ministers. Um, and ask them for their feedback on the matter. Um, okay, great. Um, just to be able to play our part. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so <laughs> sticking to the topic at hand, uh, I think it's also interesting. Um, they mentioned that they will still be providing funding, DTIC, um, to the factories, but that they were concerned about a shortfall in funding for um, IDZs, or no, SEZs in particular. Um, and so we can inquire about the funding that will be made available to Atlantis for that. Uh, and also, um, there was the suggestion that they spoke about changing the deliverables or the targets um, for uh, SEZs in particular. Um, I'm not sure if that requires further engagement, firstly, with Atlantis 
um, or asking DTIC rather how they plan on re-envisioning this program given the lack of funding, but perhaps that's something to follow up on once we get a reply. Does that make sense? Can't we say, you know, pursue it now uh, by frame, by, by, by wording the question to such an extent that, uh, you know, they would be able to respond now already. Okay, so we'll leave out that targeted suggestion maybe for now and just get the information we need in terms of um, the tax incentives and um, the funding for the factories. All right, members, everyone happy? Okay, going, going, going. Uh, with that, meeting adjourned. Um, if you're not going to Scopa, enjoy the weekend. Um, and if you are, I'll see you shortly. Please help yourselves to lunch as well. Thank you, members.